What is up, guys? Welcome to the transparency. Or can you can you send that to my email there, Miss Kelly? Um, I think I'm, I think I'd rather watch it from Judge Judge's actual page. But welcome everybody to the live. Let's see if there's any decisions being made today. Probably not. You know how they roll. Hi from uh, Louisiana. Hi from wherever. Let's see. I don't expect too long of a hearing, but you never, never know. This is a four o'clock hearing for us on the East Coast, but it is um, one there, so. Again, what is good, everybody? Welcome. I I haven't slept in over 30 hours, so. So again, hello, everybody. One of my new hoodies. New Heights, baby! Taking this shit to a whole nother level. One of my favorite podcasts, actually. Supporting. Um. Let's see. Again, it is, what is it? Uh, it's 4 o'clock. I'm sorry. It's four o'clock there. It's about to be seven o'clock here. Um, let's see, I wanted to. You need to sleep, girl. You know. You're running on empty, Lana. Yes, I'll be going to bed. Um, I'm actually going to be pushing my live. They had an issue with StreamYard today. We couldn't stream anything from like 11 to 1. So... I had to push back the live that I wanted to do in the morning. And then when I pushed it back, I pushed it back to a time frame that wasn't even, I couldn't even stream. So, um, but damn, I missed you. Oh, hi. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to make my, my president green versus Steve, uh, live tomorrow at the same time that I was planning on doing it today. So, but You know they don't start right on time, so. But I want to use, I, I want to use Judge Judge's channel. Keep it. I have so many <laughs> um, pages open tabs open so <clears throat> um it at judge john judge yeah i need that to be sent to my email miss kelly so delete that out of here and send that to my email does no good for me here So I can't click on shit. Let's see. Yep. It says, Dear Truth and Transparency, a change in YouTube's API caused users to be unable to stream to YouTube from 11, 18 a.m. to 1, 24 p.m. We are reaching out to you because based on our logs, you may have been affected. Yeah, I was affected. <laughs> oh, shit. So. Oh, good job, Boston. Go get yourself some eggs. Go get yourself some eggs. Again, everybody, welcome to the transparency. It is... Brian Koberger is back in front of the judge. So is Ann Taylor. So is Bill Thompson. And we're going to see what's going on with the survey says part two. So we'll see what's up. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Again, I'm I'm expecting a quick uh, hearing, but we may be hearing actually from the expert, so we'll see what's up with that. Um, but yeah. Oh, there we go. It's it's ready to go. We are now on record. This is a uh, stage uh, for uh, Faith versus uh, Brian Koberger, case number CR 2922805. Mr. Uh, Koberger is here in the courtroom. Uh, represented by Liz Taylor and Liz Mathis. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Thompson and Liz Jennings representing the state. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we have uh, Mr. Nye and Ms. Bate, uh, Beatty on Zoom. Anybody else? I'm just going to... Ms. Taylor? No, Mr. Logsdon is not going to be on Zoom today. He has the other hearing. Ms. Baby made it, apparently. So, um, and I have uh, also, you have Mr. Edelman, Dr. Uh, Edelman here today? I do, Your Honor. Okay. Great. So, I think what we're doing today is just a continuation about the um, questions, particularly on the surveys and where we go from here. Uh, I, you did uh, drop off a sealed exhibit, right? And anything to say about this or just? Yes, Your Honor. That sealed exhibit goes with one of our discovery requests that the exhibit that outlines what we're requesting has to be under seal. And so I had to hand deliver that to the court. A copy was hand delivered to the state. It is not up for discussion today. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one other thing that this uh, tie up is the order unsealing the state's motion for order prohibiting contact with uh, prospective jurors. There was a discussion between both of you about redacting a particular sentence, maybe, last time. And so that we were going to take care of that. I didn't, Ms. Taylor indicated that there was a sentence she thought we might want to consider redacting. I haven't heard back on that. And I, I know that she's been busy on other things since the sixth. You want to just talk to each other for a second? I can. I understand the microphones in the courtroom are very sensitive. Perhaps we should do this after court today and go ahead and do the testimony of Dr. Edelman first. And I'd be happy to That's talk fine. to the state afterwards. Thanks. All right, so is that where we're starting now? Yes, Your Honor. Actually, okay. Judge, I, I think we need to discuss some preliminary matters first. Okay, go ahead. Um, as Your Honor indicated just a moment ago, this is a continuation of where we were on the 6th. And, um, the issues on the six and the issues that we have here today is first, whether there was violation of the non-dissemination order. And if so, uh, where do we go forward from that point? And I think it was clear uh, from our discussions on the six that the fact-specific questions did violate the order. Um, I, I realized that the defense would like to have, would like to proceed with those questions as perhaps an issue for today. Um, but I just wanted to define what we're looking at today because um, about quarter to 11 this morning, we got what was up on the screen there, a PowerPoint that apparently Mr. Edelman prepared. And as I understand, I don't think Ms. Taylor got it until sometime this morning herself. That's, that's the information that I was given. Um, and we have concerns because a large part of this PowerPoint deals with the issue of a change of venue itself, which is we are not prepared to address. It is not before the court at this time. It is premature. Uh, and I don't think that it should be part of this record as we proceed forward today. Uh, and so the state took a copy of preparing a, a printout of the PowerPoint. It doesn't take long to look through it. 
perhaps the court might want to take a look at that uh, before we proceed, at least with eliciting things that are from the power. And I realize it's last minute, but the last time that we present something to the court in advance, Ms. Taylor complained profusely, uh, and I realized it was only quarter to 11 when we got this today, and so we just figured we would raise it with you now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, I would disagree with counsel that the court made a determination that we violated the non-dissemination order. In my mind, that issue is very right for the court today, as is where do we go from here with the survey? Dr. Edelman has made himself available in court to explain the survey, the process of the survey, why it works, how it works, how long it's been used, how widely it's used, and what it doesn't do and what it does do to present the court with some options to make a decision where we go from here. Whether the court decides we violated the non-dissemination order or not is up for discussion and we're prepared to further argue that, but we think you need to hear the testimony first. As far as this PowerPoint, I had access to Dr. Edelman yesterday afternoon and we worked on it late. I didn't have a final copy to give to the state until this morning. So they have it. The, we are not arguing venue now. We're talking about survey and how that relates to our change of venue motion. We know we're arguing the venue change later, but we have work that we still need to do. And that's where we are today and would ask to present our PowerPoint and present our testimony with Dr. Edelman as we've prepared to do. Okay. Taylor, so actually, our Ms. Taylor still has a copy of the PowerPoint that made available for the court. Okay, so it seems like this happens uh, to me in this case that I, I there's an argument about whether I should go ahead on something or provide some information that I don't see yet. So I feel like sometimes I'm making decisions that uh, are. I'm in the blind here, so I'm going to look this over. Any problem with that? Ms. Well, Taylor? Judge, give me just one second. Your Honor, the purpose of the PowerPoint is to inform the court about the questions in the survey and the purpose of them. I can tell the court that showing up every time we want to have a hearing and have to fight to have the actual hearing is something I haven't experienced before either. There is nothing in that PowerPoint that the court can't hear today when making the decision about where do we go from here and did I violate the non-dissemination order. There, there's just nothing wrong with the process that we're doing here and you're continually being asked to say there's something wrong with what we're doing. We're 10 after four. I have a witness who's traveled here today and we're ready to go. All right, Your Honor, just to clarify, as we made clear the last time we were in court, we are not saying Ms. Taylor herself violated the non dissemination oh, We're my. saying that the people who prepared the survey and disseminated the survey and called citizens of Latah County with those fact specific loaded questions violated the non dissemination order and they are agents of the defense. So I, I don't want this to become personal between Ms. Taylor and myself. We are not alleging Ms. Taylor has done anything wrong. Then there's no. We are dealing jail. with reality that this survey was conducted on, as we understand it, 400, I'll say, innocent citizens of Latah County who were force-fed information that they may or may not have had about this case before they were called by the survey takers. And they are loaded questions. Some of the questions are factually wrong. They simply aren't true. That's what we're here about. And that's what we're prepared to address, Your Honor. That's why we have a witness here. And if there's a violation of the non-dissemination order, it's me. I'm the one that's bound by it. And the court just needs to hear about this process instead of hearing the conclusion that the state wants the court to reach. Number one, I'm, I'm, I'm past that. I'm not going to violate you. I mean, this was uh, a miss, sort of miss um, communication problem with uh, with Dr. Edelman not getting the order. Um, one of the things I, I think that maybe you need to clear up, not for counsel, but maybe the public, is that um, 
one of the one of the terms in that, and this is in the ethics, right? Is uh, is what is the public uh, record? Public record is not uh, traditional media. It's not social media. It's not what anyone might say in public. Okay, that's the problem that we're kind of balancing here because. Um, the public record is case that is available to the public in this case. I mean, I, I think we can all agree with that. No? No. no. You think the public record is whatever the media comes I, out? Your Honor, I think it's what's in the public. And what's in the public is derived from the affidavit that supported probable cause to arrest Brian Koberger. That's the first document that the court finds in the the whole cases of interest on Idaho State Supreme Court's website. That document has a ton of information in it that relate to the questions in the survey for the case specific questions. So that document became public record and that was spread far and wide all over the place and reported and interpreted repeatedly. repeatedly. That's the public record. That's where the questions came from. There's no violation of the non-dissemination order, if that's what we're going to talk about today. But I think the court should hear from our witness and understand a little bit more about this survey process. I, I'm very interested in that. I told you last time that I'm interested in what we have to say about this. But uh, So you're saying that the public record, though, comes out of the case, right, that's public. I'm saying in this case, that's exactly what happened, Judge. I, I don't want to argue the finer points of what's in the media, but I'm saying in this case, that's exactly what happened. If that affidavit's there, and this court knows we have a ton of things that are filed under seal and more things that are not filed under seal. But that affidavit that began this case has been shared far and wide, and media stories have generated. When you understand how Dr. Edelman does his work to determine if a survey even needs to happen, you'll know where the information came from. Okay, so I, I'm understanding, okay, the initial probable cause affidavit is part of the public record. And you're saying, well, that got spread, okay, by the media as you would accept, um, and that's something that could be concerned. So what I think maybe, I don't know, what Mr. Thompson is talking about though is uh, information or questions that were not. And, and so what I'm nervous about that this, is I don't want to continue to spread things out that shouldn't be spread. And so <laughs> I don't know what's in the, in the slides, but if there's information in the slides that is that are not in the public record, that really have not been um, disseminated generally, then I mean, I don't really want to spread it. None of us want to spread it more than Necessary. This is going to come out at the non well, at the hearing last week in court. That was right inside the courtroom. That all became part of the public record. The nine questions were stated repeatedly by um, Bill Thompson, in different formats by Mr. Thompson. That's part of the public record. We've been accused of violating the non dissemination order. Dr. Edelman's reputation has been impugned by what was stated about him repeatedly. Those questions are. Fair game. But having this hearing and allowing our expert to talk about this process, that, that's not the problem. This, the problem with the media happened a long time ago, and it started with the sharing of the affidavit far and wide. I understand that. I that I'm pulled in two different directions right now because I'm trying to protect your client at the same time. So if we keep if we keep uh, talking about oh my this, God. What, uh, uh, is not true, okay? I mean, I guess we could just say, well, it's not true on some of these questions. Maybe that helps to reduce bias. But if uh, if we don't make that clear, then it could increase bias. I think, 
I, I don't know. Tell me. I maybe well I'll hear this from the expert. I'm going to say it like this. Mr. Kohlberger is my client, and his rights are of the utmost importance to me. Him being treated fair, his presumption of innocence, him having an impartial jury, those are important things to me, as is his right to counsel. I am not standing up here saying, let me tell you about, about this survey. Let me finish this survey to hurt him. I'm saying there is pervasive media coverage in this case. It's prejudicial media coverage. We've conducted a survey in Latah County. That survey is going to show bias and that you shouldn't have a trial in this county. What I'm trying to do is say, do you want me to give you information about another place where maybe the bias isn't so great, where maybe Mr. Koberger can have a fair trial? I'm his advocate. I want to help him. I believe in his innocence. I'm not going to stand in this court and do anything wrong to him at all. I need you to hear the information so you can make a decision to have the surveys, to have the information when we come back here for change of venue and make a decision on, on all of these <laughs> things. Right now, if we come in and do our change of venue, we're going to say you can't have this jury in Latah County, but I can't tell you a better place that will protect him better. And that's what I want to do. Any slides, Mr. Thompson? We aren't here to argue about venue today. We aren't here to argue about uh, what this particular survey with the loaded questions, fact loaded questions, may have produced on the way talk out of residence. Um, as we mentioned last week, the structure of those questions is assumes that every person that is called has heard all of the media in this case. And we know that that just simply isn't true. So for those citizens in this in this county who have not heard all of the rumors, who have not been following the media, who haven't inspected the court record, who are essentially ignorant of facts in this case, well, that's just been gen jaundiced by the questions that were asked. They have now been force fed facts, some of which are not true, some of it which would not be offered in court, and in fact, probably wouldn't legally be admissible in court to somebody who may never have heard them before. That's the state's concern about the way this thing is put together. And that's they, the arguments from the defense seem to be completely ignoring that point. That well, there are people out here who don't know all the things that they were being asked. And by asking the fact specific questions, we were inoculating them with information that they didn't have before about this case that could affect their ability to sit as jurors. It's just simply irresponsible. It doesn't make sense. This is one of the things that I was, I was thinking about is maybe we can inoculate by saying you can't rely on any of this information. It's not, it's not established by evidence. It's not been provided in court. Um, but to just send a message out to, to be clear that these these questions have nothing to do with guilt or innocence or even truth. It has to do with bias. Judge, uh, I don't. We gotta. I have to. We have to fix this in some way. Yes, sir. That's what you said last time. And so I, I just want to help the public understand that this is not the trial. Your Honor. Yes. That's right. We may never get to try. We know this isn't the trial. We brought Dr. Edelman to talk about the process, which will answer the state's concerns about this process. He hasn't even had a chance to tell you how this is constructed. He's the one that's He's the being doctor biased. of this kind of work. He's the one that's the professional. He's the one that knows how to do this. He's the one that spent his career understanding surveys and how to construct these. You need to hear from him. Going back and forth between what Bill thinks and what I think doesn't matter. Yes! What matters is you hearing from the expert to make a decision. He's here. He's ready to testify. We're 20 minutes into this hearing, and he hasn't been allowed to take the stand yet. He came to inform the court about this process. Well, there's no question I'm going to let him testify. Yes. I just wonder about what's in this. I haven't looked at this, but oh, shut up! It's you, you're you're uh, 
comfortable having this come out into the public? Yep. Yes. After last week's hearing. Oh, God, what I do? Ooh, ooh. Sorry. Absolutely. Okay. And you looked at it, Mr. Thomas. You have concerns, Judge. Alarming. Well, I, you have part concerns. of what's in there is uh, a part of the survey study uh, being published now, if, uh, if this comes to the public, without any comparison to anything else. And it's the product of these loaded questions. It takes us back to the fundamental issue of how this survey was conducted and the assumption that the people who were being called already knew all this stuff. And so it didn't hurt to specifically ask them, have you heard about such and such and such, the specific item? Well, if they hadn't heard about it before, they sure as heck have heard about it now. That's the core concern that led us to this in the first place. We don't dispute the defense doing a survey. I said that last week. Please do a survey, but don't go around screwing with the knowledge that prospective jurors have or may not have. Wrong. That's our concern. Let him speak. And, Your Honor, when we parted ways last week, um, the court said, you know, Ms. Taylor, talk with with uh, uh, Mr. Edelman and see if you know see what the options are. Well, my understanding from the email I received day before yesterday is um, the survey cannot be changed. That was from Ms. Taylor reporting what Dr. Edelman said. I interpret that as um, they don't want to change it. Anything can be done, but that's let him left. speak. I would have been happy to engage in discussion mm. with defense about maybe some middle ground, but the draw, line has been drawn black and white. Yep, you took the gloves off. I am concerned off. about the, the specific things that relate to venue, uh -huh. partial survey results that are in this PowerPoint. I don't think it's, I believe it is premature for them to come out now. The rest of it is fine. Let's let's bring it out so that you have whatever information you want. You can give it the weight that you decide. I just I just didn't want to let this willy-nilly come into the public press. <laughs> willy-nilly. I have lots of concerns. Uh, we're not left with this uh, because I have to make a, a decision about several things. Yes, sir. And so in, in order for me to have the most informed uh, decision, I need the information. So they're just going to go ahead. All right. Thank you. And you can, uh, you can show your slides and if something is uh, concerning uh, we can we can talk about it along with it. all right so um, are you ready to call your witness I think you are I am I'm ready to call dr. Brian Edelman. here we go baby okay, dr. Edelman if you could please come forward <sighs> face the clerk the crowd raise your goes right hand. Wild. there you go you solemnly swear that the testimony you give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury. I do. All right. Thank you, sir. If you could please uh, get, take your seat there. And then once you're comfortable, please state your name and spell your last. It's Brian Edelman, B-R-Y-A-N-E-D-E-L-M-A-N. -E -E Thank you. Ms. Thank Taylor. you. Good afternoon, Dr. Edelman. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? Um, I work as a trial consultant, and also I do quite a bit of um, work as an expert witness in the field of pretrial publicity and change events. Are those two separate roles? Yes, they are. What do you do when you're a trial consultant? So as a trial consultant, you're an, an advocate for your client. Um, you do mock trials, focus groups, um, to really try to develop a trial strategy, a trial story for your for your side to cultivate that for the audience, the jury. Um, we also do jury selection. I assist with writing voir dire questions, juror questionnaires, um, help ferret out bias during voir dire, um, recommend cause challenges and how we use peremptories. Do post trial interviews. I do. Um, jury related research, present my findings at uh, conferences, bar associations, law firms, and so on. When you work as an expert in the field of change of venue, does that differ from your work as a trial consultant? Absolutely. How so? 
Well, as I mentioned, as a trial consultant, you're retained to be an, ex an advocate. As an expert, you are retained to be an objective expert, which means I'm not advocating for either side. I do not advocate for the defense. I do not advocate for the prosecution. My role is to collect information using standard methods that have been widely accepted in the field and then present the findings to the court so they can make a well-informed decision on whether or not any remedial measures are necessary. So there are times where my findings support what uh, <laughs> remedial measures, like a change of venue, and there are times they don't. And when they don't, I recommend against a change of venue, whatever the data supports with where I go. I want to understand a little bit about your educational background that allows you to do that work. Okay. How were you educated? I'm sorry? How were you educated? What degree? Um, you starting in grammar school. Or, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can skip to college. Yeah. Um, so I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from Florida State University. Um, from there, I attended the University of Nevada in Reno, um, where I studied social psychology. Uh, my particular interest was in the application of social psychology in the field of, of the legal arena. Um, so I was really interested in juror decision making, jury decision making, group dynamics, how people process information and evidence, the impact on pre-trial publicity, pre-existing attitudes and that sort of thing. Um, the school I went to really focused on that on that area. That's where the National Judicial <laughs> College is, um, the Grant Sawyer Center for Justice Studies, and several professors in that field. So um, I conducted research at the Grant Sawyer Center uh, for Justice Studies. Um, I helped run a program through the Department of State that brought in judges and attorneys to the United States, where they would travel around the country and meet with people in their field. So I worked with the National Judicial College in that regard as well. Uh, oh, and then from there, when I finished my PhD, um, I got a Ruhrary scholarship to study in the United Kingdom, where I got an LLM in International Humanitarian Law, which I do not use. During the course of your career, have you been published? I have. Um, I've been published in the area of survey methodology. Um, uh, my research was on the death penalty, so I have a book published on the death penalty. I am the co-editor in California. The, there's something called the CEB, the Continuing Education of the Bar. And there's a criminal procedure book that comes out every year. It's kind of like the Bible for criminal procedure. And I'm a co-editor on the chapter on change of venue. Um, I was also on the committee for the American Society of Trial Consultants that um, publishes professional guidelines for writing um, uh, change of venue surveys. So on that. Um, and I've also done research on one of the questions is always, well, why can't we just pick a jury in a high profile case? So I've done research on um, the uh, use of the set aside question. So if people have been inundated with a lot of prejudicial media coverage, um, how do they respond to that set aside question? Do we see, for example, if somebody's been exposed to a lot of prejudicial coverage, you'd expect them to say, I cannot be fair and impartial. I know too much. And so we were looking at research on. And then I, last thing I promise is um, I've, I've also done research on what's called minimization language. So when you ask people an open-ended question on a juror questionnaire or in voir dire in a high profile case, this is the only standard question, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? That's the open-ended question. And people minimize what they know. That's something Dr. Ed Bronson came up with because he had noticed it. And that's like using language such as, I only recall what, I, what was in the paper or I just followed it. Um, I just remember it was on the news. You don't really elicit a lot of information. It's minimized knowledge. So did research on that. Too. That's been part of your research? Yes. Okay. When you work as an expert, in a, if you're hired as an expert to work on a change of view issue, and I think you told us how your work is different than when you're a trial consultant, can you tell me how you start in that role as an expert for change of venue? Yeah. So I've been, first of all, I've been doing this for about 15 years, I'd say, as an expert witness on this area. On change of venue, on change specifically? Of venue. Okay. And, and to do with surveys, just to be yes, clear? Yes, yes. From some of its surveys, other times it's post-conviction, and <laughs> once again, um, I've done federal cases, state cases, multiple states, including Idaho. Um, but the way I learned was from Dr. Ed Bronson, who was kind of the pioneer in the field. Um, he worked on cases like the Oklahoma City bombing case and a host of other product ones, Boston Marathon, a bunch of them. 
Um, so he was kind of my mentor in this area. And there's a three-stage process. So the first phase is collecting the media coverage. Is really the question is initially, is there extensive coverage and is there prejudicial coverage? So I collect the coverage and assess the nature of that coverage. Does it include um, inflammatory language? Does it include inadmissible or misinformation? Now, just because it's not true does not mean people don't see it. And it does not mean that they don't develop opinions based on that information. So it's very important. In fact, some of that stuff is the most prejudicial stuff that there can possibly be. For example, if there is a prior conviction and then the conviction is thrown out, well, that's pretty prejudicial for the new trial. Not admissible, but very prejudicial. So I'm looking for information like that. I'm looking for um, references to prior records. Uh, maybe there are it, it, victim impact statements where people, victims' families may be suggesting what the outcome should be. That could be prejudicial. Um, how did the community respond? Are there candlelight vigils? Are there, um, you know, GoFundMe efforts going on? The status of the victim, is it focusing on that? So there's a gambit of things that we look at. Um, sometimes there's political elements that are important in high profile cases because they might be that a politician's involved. So it just depends on the case. So the first thing is assessing the nature of the publicity. Now, if there's not a lot of extensive pretrial publicity and it's not prejudicial, it stops there. And that's happened where there's coverage, but it's very superficial, it's very neutral. There's not a lot of detail. There's nothing particularly um, impactful. Maybe it's focused primarily on just the, the victim or something like that. Um, however, there are other cases where there is extensive pretrial publicity. And then I would recommend phase two, which is a community attitude survey. Because just because there's prejudicial coverage does not mean it had an impact on the jury pool. And that is the question that matters most. What impact has the prejudicial media coverage had on the jury pool? I don't really care if it's correct information, it came from social media, it came from the news, it had an impact on the jury pool. That's what matters because they develop opinions and attitudes. And it doesn't make a difference if that fact is true or false, they still develop an opinion and an attitude about the defendant, about the evidence and perceptions of guilt. All of that is what I'm looking at. So I wanna see if the media coverage has had an impact. And that's how, why we do a community attitude survey. Um, and then depending on the results of the survey, we either, there's not enough evidence there to suggest that anything is required. It could be remedial measures such as individual sequestered blood deer. Maybe that's appropriate in some cases, all the way to the extreme case where it might be a change of end. I want to understand a little bit about the source of media you review to do your work. Can you tell me what you take a look at? I always look. I always take the conservative. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I need to object. I, this PowerPoint is being prayed, played for everybody with no foundation. It's not an exhibit. Uh, I think that's improper. I mean, I, I'm trying to listen to, to Dr. Edelman's testimony, and I keep seeing slides changing in front of me over here, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. Well, you've, you've seen the slides. I have. You looked at everybody else here hasn't. What is what so I'm bad about this? What I'm seeing here, though, is just an explanation of how he goes about in surveys. Understand that. That's what his testimony is. But we're getting this visual aid that there's no foundation for, Judge. Well, it's just to move it along. I, it just seems I, I, I may be. Well, hold on. I, I, I'm viewing him as an expert. Okay. Yes, sir. He's explaining what he does. So I'm going to. No problem with that. The PowerPoint's a problem. I don't have any problem with his testimony. All right. I'm sorry. I. Uh, I, I overruled. Frankly, I've never seen no, something like this occur. That objection. I mean, it is. This is not necessarily factual. It's just an example of how he got to where where he got. That's his testimony, but the PowerPoint is different, Judge. That's what is. I don't know why it's a seeing the PowerPoint. It's a stock when image. His testimony. You to respond to that? I do, and, Judge. This is a courtroom demonstrative aid that <laughs> helps to track the testimony of Dr. Edelman. I can hand him my computer and let him advance the screens. If that makes a big difference in it. <laughs> 
and you dog. Just helps explain his testimony. This is wild. Judge, we don't have a jury here. Let's just proceed. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Go ahead. Dr. Edelman, we were talking about where you get your information. We were talking about the what? Where you get your information. What media do you look at? I think that's where it works. Yes. So I take a conservative approach to how I do it. Um, I look at newspapers in the lo local coverage right now. So I'm interested in papers that have primary circulation in the venue. Um, a case like this has been reported in many other newspapers, but I wouldn't, for example, look at a newspaper published in Dallas because I don't know if somebody in Lake Tahoe County would be looking at a paper in Dallas. So I look at the local coverage. I try to look at like local television coverage um, to see what the, the community is likely exposed to. While we're here, I want to ask you some questions about the non-dissemination order. Okay. That's been a hot topic, and you've heard some of it again today. Are you aware that there's a non-dissemination order in this case? Yes. How did you become aware of it? Well, the first time I became aware of it was when I was reading the newspaper coverage, because that was one of the topics of media coverage, was discussing the non-dissemination order and media's efforts to have it changed. So I was able to read it and follow it in that media coverage. So that's the first time I saw it. And in January, did you receive an email from my office with the non-dissemination order? I believe I did. And you looked at a hard copy again recently? Yes. All right. Does that non-dissemination order change how you did your work? I'm sorry, can you keep in Does the existence of the non-dissemination order change how you did your work? No, it did not. Have you worked in cases where there's a non-dissemination order at other times? Many times. Was the sole source of the information that you use contained in the media? Was it contained in the media? Sorry. Yes. Everything I used was widely disseminated through the media. Widely disseminated. Did you find out where the media got the information? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Bill Thompson. I'm the Lake County Prosecutor. And it's sad to be here, but happy to be here at the same time. Can you turn it up? I can't hear old burger. Well, I'm going to do my best to turn this up. <laughs> and you dog! And! Oh, shit, girl! Can I put the microphone up? Is that better? I don't so yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, That's why. Let me preface: There is a pending case now in court, and I, in my office, and the investigators have to live with the restrictions that our Supreme Court places on pretrial publicity. That said, I promise you, we will share with you, through the court process or otherwise, whatever we are allowed to. I just appreciate your patience on that. The uh, factual basis for the charges are summarized in what's called a probable cause affidavit that is on file with the court. According to the rules of the Idaho Supreme Court, that is sealed until Mr. Kohlberger is physically back in Latah County and has been served with the Idaho arrest warrant. At that time, we expect that that affidavit will be available to you so you can share the true facts with all of your readers and your watchers and your listeners uh, and all the people who are interested and really need to know what's going on. So please have patience with us on that. Uh, we hope to get that to you as soon as we can. In that clip, you heard reference to the probable cause affidavit. Yes. And did you hear reference to sharing it with all your readers and watchers? Readers, watchers, and listeners, and anyone else who's interested. Did your research tell you that the media took Mr. Thompson up on that offer to share this far and wide? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. What did you say? 
basically the media took that document and then published the highlights and key findings in that document and added editorial commentary to that information. So let's be clear, they didn't just read the half David, there's editorial, there's debate, there's discussion, there's spin, all of it in news stories. And these stories, for example, this one has over 200, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see it. Do you have a copy of the? Uh, I do, um, Your so Honor, I have a printed copy of his PowerPoint, if it would help him refresh his memory. I just can't see it. Sure, just go ahead. Okay, thank you. Now I see why Bill had a big ass problem with this PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm so. So, for example, this one is on a local television station. On YouTube alone, 130,000 views and 224 comments. So, people discussing it. That's just one example of how this document was disseminated through the media in this county just as Mr. Thompson suggested during his press conference. And did you check another media source and see that it continued to be shared? Yes, this is a second example. Um, and you can see just from the heading, it says court records unsealed. And then they go through a timeline, including information from that affidavit, um, highlighting all the key findings about the car and other things that are widely reported and disseminated from that document to late to count, saturating the community with prejudicial details from that document, which was reported in the press conference to be truthful as well. Um, 54,000 views, 176 comments on just one other video of, of a news clip on YouTube. And based on your research, did the story or stories continue to be shared far and wide? Yes. If Janelle Finch is joining Cases received massive media coverage, saturating this county with prejudicial pretrial rules. How about to social media? It was also spread through social media, and people have talked about it on social media. And do you know if misinformation and rumors ended up uh, as a result of this information shared right from the start. Yes, and the reason I looked at this and knew it was because in the media covers, they discussed the spreading of rumors on social media. For example, a professor who was accused by a psychic of being responsible for this. Um, other references to questioning the implication of people knew about the, um, the crime before it was reported to the police and so on. So there's been quite a bit of discussion spread of new rumors, misinformation, factual information, all over social media, which you'd expect in a small community such as this. Did your review of all of this information tell you as a professional, as an expert in your field, that a survey was necessary in Brian Koberger's case? Yes, based off of the uh, media coverage that I reviewed, which was over 200 plus articles and the television coverage, I thought it was appropriate to move forward to see what impact, if any, this coverage has had on the community. What kind of survey did you think would be appropriate? Um, we always use random digit dial telephone surveys um, in, in these cases. Before you tell me a little bit more about that, I wanna understand the history of this kind of survey. This Is this something that you just made up all on your own? No. Where does no. this come from? So these surveys have been done for decades. Um, the first one I recall that followed a similar design and focus on case-specific items was done in 1979, um, Constantini and King in three cases in Yolo County, California. Um, this approach was done, you know, Dr. Ed Bronson, who I mentioned, my mentor, had been using it for decades, 40 years or more. Um, other experts in the field do it. John Walker in the American Taliban case, they used a similar approach that was published as well. Um, it's used in skilling, Boston Marathon. Um, I've used it in countless cases, so hundreds of times, I would say. Is there research that supports this process? There is. Um, one of the things we're looking at, so when you think about the survey, is the structure and, and how we test validity. So 
there's 40 plus years of social science literature on the impact of media coverage on juror and jury decision making. And one of the things it tells us, for example, is knowledge, but for, let's take a step back. People who regularly watch and listen to the news are more likely to know about the case. When they say know about the case, they're more likely to have case-specific information from the media. So they test similar things like we did. Have you read, seen, or heard if dot, dot, dot. And they assess how much knowledge does this person have? And then they correlate it with media consumption habits. And what you find is people that read the news regularly know more of these details than people who do not. And they find that the more information you have, the more likely you are to hold an opinion regarding the defendant's guilt or innocence. So those are some of the findings. And we craft the survey similar to the others because we want to test the validity of the survey. So if we know we should see these relationships, we should expect to see them in our survey. So we ask the same similar types of questions, and we look at those relationships to see if we see the same thing. That's one of the ways we test the validity of the survey. Would this be considered a methodology in your field to do surveys in this certain format? Yes, it's standard practice. We look at um, APOR, which is called the American Association of Public Opinion Research, American Society of Trial Consultants. They have professional code on how to conduct surveys, venue surveys. Um, those are the primary ones I look at. Um, and again, there's I've taken course training during my program on how to craft surveys, how to write questions, all of that type of thing. I've done it hundreds of times, um, testified about it. Um, so that's kind of the basis of how I craft this. And I heard you mention standards and validity. Mm -hmm. um, why, why are there standards? Why does that matter? I'm, I'm sorry, why are there standards? Yes. Well, one is you want to make sure, I mean, there, as we learn more about research and, and human behavior, we learn more about what you should and shouldn't do. So, for example, um, there's something called social desirability. Um, people want to create a positive impression of themselves. So when you ask questions, for example, can you be a fair juror? Well, we all want to be fair people, so you're more likely to get a socially desirable response. The initial step on that was all the way back into voting. Um, in California, there was an election for governor, Davis or something like that. Uh, and all of the polling suggested he was going to win. He was African American and um, he lost. And that was when they started looking at that. And they saw all these different impacts in terms of like race of the interviewer. All these things affect how people respond. People overestimate that they vote because you can look at voting records and it's inflated. People overestimate they have a library card and a million other things. So those are things like we look at when we craft the survey. We don't want to have social. Questions that lead to social desirable responses, order effects, a host of objects. In your survey, it looks like you have sections designed in your survey. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Okay. Better with the microphone. Okay, I'll try to stand closer over here. I want to I want to understand this section. That these sections. Okay. Why do you have sections in this survey? Sections? Yes. Well, one is you don't want things to be jumping back and forth all over the place because um, it's harder to take a survey like that. You'll have more people drop off, confusion, potential order effects. So we try to organize the survey into sections. So all the key questions on one topic are together, and then the next section changes topics. So it's easier to follow. What is the purpose of section three, case awareness and prejudgment? Why is that in there? So that's the meat of the survey. That's the most important section. Um, so case awareness measures initially case recognition. We craft a recognition question based off of the media coverage. What are the things widely reported that are not overly prejudicial because you don't want to create an order that would stimulate a memory of, yes, I remember that case. So if widely reported A, B, and C facts that every you, know, you read the coverage and you see this was mentioned 100 times, that's a widely reported fact. So we create case recognition questions. Now, if somebody says, yes, I remember that case, I have read, seen, or heard about it, they are asked a prejudgment question next, the guilt or innocence question. Um, then they're asked open-ended questions and then those case-specific items. Now, let's say someone does not remember the, the case based on their back, the case recognition question. We give them one more fact to see if it'll stimulate a memory. Something neutral that might stimulate a memory. You usually get one to 2% more of that recall the case from that. 
If that person recognizes the case from there, they are also asked that prejudgment question and they continue. If they do not recognize the case, they skip the rest of the survey and are asked demographic questions about media consumption habits and demographics. Um, the next step of the survey after the prejudgment question is uh, an open-ended question. What have you read, seen, or heard about the case? There might be a few others we add based off of these things we might find in the media coverage. And then they continue on to those case-specific items that we've been talking about. Have you read, seen, or heard if so and so? I want to make sure I understand this and that this is clear for everybody. Those nine questions that have been the problem last week and this week, if you have somebody who says, no, I don't know that case, do you ask them those nine questions? No, they skip to the demographic questions. What? Tell me, what are the demographic questions, just to be sure? If somebody doesn't recognize the case, they immediately go to questions, for example, how often do you read the newspaper? Every day, several times a week, uh, rarely, never, something like that. Then they're asked how often they follow the local news, and then they're asked a few demographic questions like age, gender, race, ethnicity. So if somebody doesn't remember the case, you don't infuse information or do any of the things that were brought out last week. No. I have on the screen in front of me some of the read, seen, or heard questions. Yes. What are these? You don't have to read them all. Just tell me what they are. These are nine items, which we always use. Have you read, seen, or heard if? And these are items taken from the media coverage that were widely reported. And let me be clear, widely reported hundreds and thousands of times um, and potentially prejudicial items because neutral run-of-the-mill media coverage is often not grounds for a change of that. So if somebody knew there were four victims, that's not particularly prejudicial, is it? That's a pretty benign fact. But if somebody knows, for example, um, about a prior conviction that's not admissible, that's very prejudicial. And it might be correlated with prejudgment. And I would like to know that. Don't being trans. It is widely prejudicial and everybody knows about it. And it's correlated pre with prejudgment. That may that would likely have an impact on my recommendations because that's the type of pre child publicity that has been recognized by the Supreme Court, I'm sure the state court here, that is most concerning. So these kinds of questions, these case specific questions, you do this in all the surveys that you do. Yes. And um, in this case, these nine questions came straight out of the media. Absolutely. And again. Widely reported throughout the media, thousands of times. Now, just to be clear, you gave an example of um, information that might be widely reported that's highly prejudicial that you would use in a survey. Uh, you haven't talked about Brian Koberger's survey yet, have you? Um, what do you, you haven't uh, told us the nine questions. I have not. Okay. And um, we'll get there. But I want to talk about a little bit more about the history of this survey. You told us it had been used for decades. And I think you told us a little bit about some of the other really high profile cases where this survey format, the survey survey method that's been widely accepted was used. Uh, are some of these cases your cases that you've done these surveys in on this list? Yes, uh, I used these types of questions in the George Floyd case for Alexander King, who was one of the defendants. There was also a gag order or non-dissemination order in that case. The Parkland shooting case in Florida, there was a non-dissemination order in that case. Used there as well. Used it in the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting case in Pittsburgh. Um, State of Idaho v. Jonathan Renfro, which was here. State of Idaho v. Gilberto Rodriguez also used it there. And many others. I've used it 100 times. Dr. Bronson used it more than me because he was doing it even longer than I have. Um, other experts in the field do it. This is the standard practice. Standard in your field. Yes. And are these surveys, doing a survey like this, is this just criminal defendants that ask you to do these surveys or that have any interest in doing these surveys or is it other people too? Um, other people use the same process as well, including the prosecution and the government. I think you provided an example in your PowerPoint of the government using this survey process in yes. a case that you worked on. 
Yes, this was the Jason Van Dyke case in Chicago. He had, uh, had been charged with shooting and killing Laquan McDonald. Um, it was like 17 shots was like the famous saying. Uh, it was a very significant case, interracial crime, widely reported on. Um, and the government also did their own survey to see if there was any potential bias and followed the same exact process and used case-specific media items. And once again, there was a non-dissemination order in that case. Earlier, you talked a little bit about validity being one of the standards. Yes. Tell me, tell me how you measure validity in one of these surveys. Sure. So this is from the professional code from the American Society of Trial Consultants. Um, as I mentioned, we want to look at things like consistency. So we want to, for example, the research tells us the more case or media items you know, you develop knowledge. And the more you know, the more likely you are to exhibit bias. So I want to test that in the survey. That's one of the reasons why I include those case-specific items. Um, I also want to compare what people, uh, or that item, to prejudgment. So the more people know, are they more likely to prejudge? How about case-specific media items? Is there specific prejudicial items in the media that are particularly concerning? Maybe I'm going to go back to my prior conviction example. If there, if there was a conviction, so I've had this happen in the case, and then years later, that conviction was thrown out and there's a new trial. Well, that's extremely prejudicial if people know about the prior jury verdict. So I want to know do people what percentage of people know that detail, and is that related to prejudgment? And most importantly, when you ask the question, have you read, seen, or heard about the case, the open-ended question, do people report it? Because if they don't and they do know it, well, that's very concerning, and that's the type of problem we run into in voir dire. Sounds like that's one of the reasons you have case-specific questions in there. That's one of the reasons, absolutely. You heard talk last week, and then you've heard it again today about, can't you just change this survey and take those case-specific questions out and then do the survey? Can you do that? I would not do that, no. Can you explain why not? Because this is based off of 15 years of doing this. I know for certain, and there's research on it as well, that when you ask people an open-ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? They have a difficult time recalling everything from memory. That's a recall question. The cognitive effort required to recall everything from memory that you know is very challenging versus recognition, which is a much lower cognitive load. Have you read, seen, or heard if? Oh, now I can search my memory. Yes, I know that fact. If I asked you, tell me everything you know about the movie Star Wars, you would tell me a whole bunch of interesting things about Chewbacca and Ewoks, maybe a bunch of other stuff. But I am very confident that you would miss things. You would not tell me every single detail from memory you know about that movie. And then I would ask you something like, did you know that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? And you'd probably say, yeah, of course, I knew that. But you didn't mention it in the recall question. Um, there's a mountain of research on this. Usually what they do is they have people read um, like a paragraph or a story, and they ask them, write down everything you recall from what you just read. And then they do a different type of quiz. Did you read that the truck was red? Did you read that there was an ambulance? Oh yeah, of course, and they check that too. And what it shows is recognition rates, the ability to recall information when asked a closed-ended question is much higher than when you ask an open-ended question. So getting back to your comment or question, if I only ask, what do you read, know about this case? I know for a fact, you'll get things like, well, I remember when it happened, there were four victims, there was a knife, um, I remember there's a delay, um, I just saw it in the media. Those are the things that people say. They've said it in this survey. They've said it in a hundred surveys I've done prior. They've said it in Vladir when I look at transcripts. That's what you see. But when you ask those closed-ended questions, you discover that they know quite a bit more. And that's what I'm trying to look at. I need to know what do people actually know? And is there information, prejudicial details that they don't mention that they do know when you ask the open-ended question? And those those details, the closed questions, the have you read, seen, or heard questions, are they important to determine if there's bias, that media coverage has created a prejudicial effect and that there's bias? Absolutely. If 80% of people are able to recognize a prejudicial detail, 
um, and I keep making up because I don't want to upset anyone here, like a prior conviction, if 80% know that detail, but only 3% mention it in the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case, that's a major problem. I need to know that because it's an extremely prejudicial fact. Things spread on social media, whether they're true or not, they still impact the jury. Very prejudicial. I need to know if they know that. And I know for a fact in this case that, for example, I'm not going to mention the detail, but for one of them, only 3%, 3% of people in this survey mentioned the detail when asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? It was something spread on social media. But when you ask, have you read, seen, or heard of X, Y, and Z, 45% knew that fact. And that fact happened to be significantly related to prejudgment. People who knew it, over 80% of them think the defendant is guilty compared to 57% who don't know the detail. So those are important findings. If I don't include those questions, I can't do any of those analyses. It makes it look like there's not that much of a problem here. People don't seem to know anything. They just say they remember reading it in the paper. I guess we don't have to move the case because they don't seem to know much. And that is misleading, um, inaccurate. And I would not do that. Have you had um, a unique opportunity to kind of actually watch this in real time to see how it works? I have. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. How, how did you get this unique opportunity yeah. first? So the, the, I worked on a case that was called John Fight. Um, this was a Catholic priest in Hidalgo County in Texas who had been charged with murdering a beauty queen. Now, the crime had happened in like the 1950s, and the trial happened in like 2018 or something like that. So every, the, every, all the witnesses were gone, and the defendant was obviously much older. But it was a case that was just weaved in the fabric of the community. It was so shocking. And during the hearing, after doing the survey, one of the things we did is we brought in community residents and did like a mock voir dire to prove this point, to demonstrate. And there was a bunch of things in that case that were particularly prejudicial. So we asked people, tell us what you've read, seen, or heard about the case. And they would tell us, oh, in college, I learned about this case. I know A, B, and C. And you say, is that everything you remember? And they said, for example, here, I believe so. That's what this person said. Search their memory. Let's see. I believe so. That's it. And then we asked those case-specific questions that you clearly could never ask in one year because you'd be poisoning the well. And we asked, for example, did you know that John Fight gave a confession to a priest? Confessed to the crime. Oh, yeah, I knew that. And once she said that, it stimulated her memory. Actually, he confessed twice. So now she knows that. The fact that she did not mention in the open-ended question, extremely prejudicial. The Supreme Court has recognized confessions to be very prejudicial for Doe v. Louisiana and a bunch of others. And she knows that. And then we ask, kind of again, is that everything you know? And she says yes. And then we give her another one. Did you know that he was involved in another case? He had actually been involved, charged with attacking a woman in a different church. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do remember that. Once again, she knows a detail that she didn't mention. And right for saying, okay, and you didn't say that a few minutes ago, I did you? No, that's the second one. Um, and then we ask, having refreshed your memory, are there any other facts that you have read, seen, or heard that you haven't told the court? She's, I don't believe so. so. It seems like that's all she knows. Then we try it again, and we mentioned that he um, had been transferred to another monastery. The Catholic Church was moving him around. And she knows that. She said, oh, yeah, I did. Uh, and we tried again. Did you know that local law enforcement um, were participating in a, in a cover up? That was part of the story. Yep, she knows that too. So, this was an example of the difference between asking the open ended question that you can ask in Wadir What do you know about this case? What do you have heard about this case? And you get an answer. Sometimes people say, I just recall when it happened. Sometimes you get more detail. But when you start asking those closed ended questions, you uncover that actually they know quite a bit more. Um, and that is the key point in a high-profile case. In the general case, it doesn't matter because there is no case-specific information. What we know is that specific attitudes predict behavior much more than general attitudes. So when a community like this has been saturated with media coverage that's prejudicial, we want to know what case-specific details they know because that goes to bias. And are we able to ferret out that bias in jury selection? And that's why we include those questions in our survey. I want to talk about Brian Koberger's case for just a minute. Connor, again, I'm going to register the objection. This is dealing, this is going to deal with the actual issue of change of venue. <laughs> the future of the state is not going to afford the opportunity to analyze much less, much, yet much less respond to it. Um, 
So to the extent the court wishes to allow this to continue, I just simply ask you to give it that reduced amount of weight because the state is not in a position to respond to any of this. Okay, thank you. But you, you'll have an opportunity to respond to any of this for any of the decision. Um, not today, Judge. This I'm this goes this, this, this not, goes. I'm sorry. Hold on. Yes, sir. I'm not going to make a decision today. Yes, sir. I'm getting information. Yes, sir. And uh, then I'm going to consider what you're going to uh, provide, and then I'm going to make a decision. My point again, Your Honor, is this goes to the issue of a change of venue, not whether or not the non-disclosure order was violated and what we should do about that. Two separate issues. The state is not prepared and will not be prepared to address a change of venue issue until an appropriate motion with supporting um, documentation and evidence provided. And we have a chance to respond to that, which I understand we'll be doing between now and sometime next month. Exactly. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Edelman, um, you're, you haven't finished analyzing the data in Mr. Koberger's case, have you? No, the only thing I looked at was supposed to be on the question at the end, which is about these case-specific items, why they're in the survey, whether, and which goes to whether we can continue the survey without them. That's the only thing I looked at was addressing that specific question. I'm not going to ask you what your opinion on change of venue is today. I don't have one. Well, I do, but I'm not done analyzing the data. Senate, I want you to be informed before we get there. So I do want to talk, though, about Brian Koberger's case and if you've been able to determine if the survey was valid. Yes, absolutely. And how did you determine that the survey is valid? Well, one of the things, as, as I mentioned, is looking at the social science research and do we find similar findings? And we did. So we also look, for example, do we have like acquiescence bias? What that means is people are just saying yes to everything. So on those case specific media items, one of the things you do is you include items that were didn't receive as much media attention. That way you wanna make sure and what you expect to see are items that get a lot of media attention, everybody knows about. So you can see really high recognition rates, 80%, 90%, 60%. And then the items that didn't get as much attention, they're lower. 40% or less. So we want to see if there's variance across the questions, and we see that as well. Does it help to do the recall questions and the recognition questions to understand whether you have a valid survey? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, well, as I meant, those are the case-specific questions. Yeah, those are the media items. So we, we test validity by, are those correlated with prejudgment? Um, are they correlated with media consumption? So People who read more of the media, do they know more of these details than people who don't? Um, are there, if you, the more details you know, are you more likely to be biased? All that stuff. But also, again, like I said, is you want to check to make sure there's variance across those media items because you want to make sure people aren't just saying yes to them. You talked early on about how if somebody doesn't recognize the case, you stop and you don't ask these case-specific media generated items in your request. Correct. And remember, these media items also come after the open-ended, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? Do you know how many people did not know about Brian Koberger's case in this survey, the percentage? I believe it was like three to four percent. And so that percentage of people didn't get the case-specific questions. Is that fair? The people who did not know about the case, the very few, did not get the case-specific questions. I want to talk about the open-ended questions and then the have you read, seen, or heard questions. So on the open-ended questions, when you say, what do you know about this case? Tell me everything. Uh, do you know about how many things people remember? Yes. So one of the things we do is we read every one and we track how many details they mention, and then we compare those. What do they say to how many case specific items they later recognize? So, for example, if somebody said, I know four people were killed and they found the guy, I would identify like they, you know, two facts, two details, for example. And then I would look at those case specific items later and how many of those items did he mention in the open? And that scenario would be zero. But if he knew six of them, that would tell me that he knew six details that he failed to recognize. Um, versus somebody might have known all those details and mentioned all of them and they're open. 
then it would be zero. They reported everything they knew, and they mentioned later on that they knew those items. So I look at that. You're checking what they say they know in the general open question, and then see if they hit some of the specific questions, right. and then measuring how many more they actually know when you get to the have you read seen right. the question. And then I compare. And that kind of goes to my John Fight story, I'm looking to see if that is a problem. What did you find in this case? I found that 96% of survey respondents knew at least one additional media item that they failed to mention in the open-ended question. Uh, on average, people reported 1.6 details when asked the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? However, on average, they later recognized six out of the nine media items, and I believe it's something like 72% new set, I want to say five or more. Now, in, in this situation, did you find out people had a lot of knowledge that wasn't the specific case-related questions? They would rattle off, I know these things, several things. Yeah, so, so what I found was, on average, people knew at 4.9 additional items that they failed to mention in the open. So what does that mean? That means they knew approximately five of the media items that I tested later that they did not mention in the open-ended. But on average, out of nine, they knew, although they didn't mention them. And these are examples. So somebody wrote just what has been on the TV and the papers. That's the common thing you get when you only ask the open-ended question. But that person knew all nine of the media items we tested. Someone else mentioned the detail. The kids were murdered and they tracked them down. Well, you actually know six out of the nine media items that we tested. Without being lately, no seven out of the nine media items tested. And it goes on and on. That is a very common finding. I find it in almost every survey I do. Between 92 and 96% is the norm. Of what I see in terms of knowing more detail than they report. And it usually, interestingly, the average is usually around three extra media items that they failed to mention. In this case, it was 4.9, so it was higher. Do you have a way within the survey to correlate prejudicial coverage or bias for guilt with the amount of specific details recognized? Yes, because I asked those case-specific questions. If I didn't, I would not be able to, because as you saw, People say things like, haven't seen anything lately. Well, that doesn't really do much for me. I can't analyze that. I can't do anything with that. I don't ask those case-specific items. I can't test the validity of the survey. I can't test to see how case-specific knowledge impacts prejudgment. I can't test to see if there's one particular item that's highly prejudicial that we should be worried about, that should, you know, that's inadmissible. What percentage knows that detail? Um, all of those things are required to do is correct. And how do you know that there's prejudgment in a case? Um, how, what questions do you ask, and when do you ask them to know that there's prejudgment or bias in a uh, case? Well, after the case recognition question, they're asked, based off of what you've read, seen, or heard about this case, do you believe the defendant's guilty of whatever the crime is, and it's on scale, like definitely guilty to definitely not guilty. Um, so that's a prejudgment question. I have a second follow-up question, which was actually developed from a judge that I thought was really effective. And the question was, um, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? So it was a presumption of guilt as opposed to a presumption of innocence. This was in Tennessee. It was a high profile case. And similarly, people would report a lot of detail and then they'd say, I think he's guilty. And then they'd ask, well, can you be fair and impartial? And they'd go, yeah, I think I could be fair. I can try. I think I could do it. And then the court would ask, well, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? And they'd say, oh yeah, definitely. It could be hard to change my mind. So I use that question because I thought it was really effective. And it happens to correlate much better than a set-aside question with prejudgment um, and a host of other things. Did you ask those questions before you say, have you read, seen, or heard these particular? Absolutely. If you didn't, you'd be creating order. So you have to do that. Will you say that again? You'd be creating what? order effects. Um, if, I, if I put in, a, in like a recognition question, some detail that's extraordinarily prejudicial, I'll go back to my prior conviction thing for the same crime, and then you say, oh, do you think he's guilty? Well, you just told me he, a jury convicted. 
Of course, I think he's guilty. So you, you, do, you if you included all those nine items, and then you ask somebody, do you think he's guilty? You just gave them all this information that's prejudicial. So yes, that would be an order. Of, so we would never do that. So you ask them well ahead of case specific well, questions. They have to recognize the case. They have to agree, I know of this case. And then you ask if they already have an idea of what they think of whether Mr. Koberger is guilty or not in our case. Correct. And then you ask the case recognition and you can measure the bias or the prejudicial effect of the media like with poorly. the incidence of those questions. What right? I look at is the prejudgment question, right? That's on a scale, so Likert scale. Um, and then I can look at things like, is a relationship between the number of details somebody knows and the strength of opinion? Definitely guilty, for example, if you know a lot of detail. I can look at case-specific items, uh, media items. Um, if you knew about X, is that correlated with prejudgment or bias? Is there something that, you know, and so on and on. So that's how we look at the relationship between prejudgment um, and these different factors. Were you able to determine if case knowledge was impacting bias in Brian Koberger's case? Yes. So because we asked these questions, what we found is that um, one, like, like I said, very high recognition rate. So. 79% of respondents knew at least five of these items. So the idea that we're set, like undermining his due process rights, everybody knows all this stuff. It's very high rates. 82% um, of respondents who recognize seven of these items or more reported that he's guilty, compared to if they only knew two or fewer, only 29% thought he was guilty. And the average was 6.2. So the average number of these details people already know, 6.2. Given specific case-related bits of information, these nine have you read, seen, or heard questions, does recognizing one of those questions, if that's a, oh yeah, I know that one, yeah. does that change the incidence of bias, or does that relate to, I've already prejudged this case? It does. Um, and what's really interesting is kind of going back to the open-ended question. So the, um, again, I won't mention the detail, but there's one that was widely reported. It's in that affidavit. And 81% um, of survey respondents knew that specific detail. 81% when we asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? However, on the previous question, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? The open-ended, only 8% reported it. 8% report it when you ask the open-ended question. 81% actually know the detail when you ask a recognition question. That's significant, and I can only do that analysis because we ask those questions. And 72% of people who knew that detail reported that he is guilty compared to just 47% who don't know the detail. So that's the kind of analysis we look at. What do these case-specific items look like? Um, if you know this media item, is it correlated with guilt? A percentage of people know that media item. How many people mention it in the open? Is it consistent or is it a perfect overlap? Or nobody says, talks about it, but they all know it. And another one, only three, I think it was 3%, 3% mentioned a specific detail that was on social media, widely reported in the news, not factually accurate, a, a misrepresentation of the truth. 45% knew it in the survey. Only 3% reported it in the open-ended comment. And it was extraordinarily prejudicial where if you did know it, 81% of survey respondents, if they knew that detail, indicated that the defendant was guilty. 81%, half the sample knew about it, but only 3% mentioned it when I asked the open-ended question. So again, if I didn't ask those questions, and the only thing I asked was the open-ended question, it would appear that people don't know a lot of prejudicial detail because they don't mention the detail when you ask that question. And that is, from my experience, doing post-conviction work, reading what year transcripts, coding transcripts, doing hundreds of jury selections, being involved in these cases, coding juror questionnaires. This is the phenomenon that we see all the time. It's nothing new. And the only way to look at it is by doing the surveys. Before I ask the question about courts relying on surveys to make decisions, using these surveys to make decisions to change venue, when you talk about things that are in the media, that aren't true or might not come in. We've heard a lot about that today. Do, 
Are you telling me that that's still going to be in my courtroom? Things that aren't true that don't get brought out in trial, those are still going to be in the jurors' minds? Absolutely. And again, there's social science research on this, looking at the impact of inadmissible content, the effectiveness of judicial instructions, and how it impacts jury decision making. Just because you say it's not evidence doesn't mean it's not prejudicial. Just if I know it, um, it impacts how I view the defendant. It serves as a filter through how I process information. I might expect to hear that information when I can assume that I will, so it has an impact. One interesting study looked at jurors' ability or response, survey response, no, I'm sorry, participants' ability to recall the source of information. And what they found is after a few days after a trial, people couldn't recall what information they had learned from the media and what information they recalled and learned from the trial. So they assumed stuff in the media came out in trial. The idea that I can cognitively say, okay, I know this prejudicial detail and I'm going to put it in a box in my mind and never think about it and process everything um, and it's never going to affect me. It's just there's nothing to support that. It's kind of in our everyday lives. That's what our brains like. Think about what's going on in them today with Trump and Biden and all that. Everybody has strong opinions. The idea that, oh, yeah, well, it's not legitimate or that fact is wrong. It's misinformation, so it won't affect me. There's nothing to support that. There's even research that shows you, you have people, you, they read a passage, that they write it something supporting a, a, a position that was in the passage, and then you tell them that information is not true. It's called belief perseverance or belief persistence. And what they find is even when you tell them that fact is not true, they still have a difficult time not believing it, and it still impacts their views. They still defend it, even then. So there's a host of research on this. The idea that we should only test things that are factually accurate and assume that the other stuff isn't prejudicial is just ridiculous. So a massive amount of prejudicial media coverage is a factor that has to be considered in a case with this kind of coverage. Is that right? Yes. I, I want to know, though, from your experience, have you done a survey like this that contained these nine case-specific questions where a judge decided to change venue? Yes. Will you tell us about that? Yes. So in, in Nichols, it was a case in Washington, and this is kind of what I was referring to. So it was a defendant who had been convicted in 2012 for murder, Grant County, in Washington. Um, later, it was a high-profile case, and then later the conviction was thrown out. It had something to do with jury instructions or something like that, and there was going to be a new trial. And, you know, quite a bit of time had gone by, like a decade. Um, so we did a survey because that fact, knowing that detail, would be highly prejudicial. So what we found was 42% of, or of survey respondents had read, seen, or heard about the prior conviction when we asked that case-specific media item. However, when we asked the open-ended question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case? Only 12% mentioned it. So 12% mentioned it when you ask the open-ended question you use in voir dire, but over 42% knew about it. Now, you could never ask a juror, well, did you know a jury convicted him of murder if you didn't mention it because you're poisoning the well? Um, and the court agreed and was worried about the effectiveness of voir dire as a remedy in that situation and granted a change of that. Have you had the opportunity um, to pay attention to oh, shit. Here we go. any prejudicial media coverage since okay, the yeah. hearing last week? Go get yourself some in. I have. What is Love that it. coverage? <clears throat> Love it. Well, it created a misrepresentation, false narrative that we, myself specifically, had done something to it wrong to poison the well, taint the jury pool, um, and using language like that. That became part of the narrative. Um, I saw it on Reddit on social media, in the news, that once again, going into this idea, I love you, Anne. the story was that the defense bitch. had done something wrong, debate about whether it was part of their tactic to delay, um, get them off on a technicality, and so on. And again, what I did, just want to be clear, is the standard practice in the industry done hundreds of times in high-profile cases throughout this country. There's nothing I did to contaminate the jury pool. Everything I included was widely disseminated by the media in this county hundreds of times, if not more. And they, most of it came directly from an affidavit that the government released in a press conference and encouraged everyone to report. 
Did I tell you what questions to ask? You did not. Would you take my advice if I told you what questions to ask? No. I would not. And I'll tell you why is, as I mentioned, my role is to be an objective expert to provide the court with information so the court can make a decision on if any remedial measures are necessary. I don't care what questions you want in the survey, and I don't care what questions the government wants. In the survey. What I want to do is conduct a valid survey that's objective, reliable, and provides meaningful information that can be used by the court. Do you believe comparative surveys in other counties would provide the court with more information about what to do when we get to change a venue hearing? I do. Why? Because this case has received a lot of media attention across the state. It's a national case. And depending on what the results are of the survey, I'm assuming if we find that there's grounds for a change of venue here, that's a recommendation, the response will be, well, there's nowhere else to move it. Everybody's been cut saturated with free child publicity, so there's no need to change it. The point of the comparison survey is to address that question. Is there anywhere in the state where you could do that? Maybe there's not. I don't know. Um, but that's the only way to find out. And you have to conduct the survey in the same manner. I don't know. If I just ask people what they know about the case and you get general, I just recall when it happened, but you have the same guilt rate. Do they know inadmissible details? Do they know about things from that affidavit? Do they have a lot of case specific knowledge or is it just a general awareness of the case? Do they drive by the house where the crime occurred? All these things, all these things that make this county unique that you want to test for in other communities. So it's not just a question of general awareness. I need to know what case specific information they have, what misinformation they have, what media items they've been exposed to. Do they have as much uh, case detail and knowledge as they do here? All of those things. So, that's why I would suggest it's important. Um, without that, the only thing I can do would be to collect the media coverage and assess, for example, like, are there fewer articles published in Bonneville County or Ada County compared to here? That's all we have. I wouldn't conduct a survey that I know is going to lead to misleading information. I'm not going to do that. To change the survey, would that go against the methodology that you use? <laughs> Yes, if I, if I change the survey and I don't conclude those items, I can't test. Well, do people know a lot of case specific information that was widely reported? Are those specific <laughs> items related to bias? Um, which items do they know? Do they know the ones that were all over social media or not? Like, <laughs> that's the whole point of asking those questions. What you'll get is, well, I don't know much, but I saw it when it first happened. I remember reading about it a while ago, but haven't seen anything. Hey. I know the defendant yeah. was, uh, you know, arrested or whatever um or things like oh i followed it close okay great followed it closely does that mean they know a lot i don't know can't assess just from someone said i read the news or i followed it quite a bit that doesn't tell you anything that's not meaningful information so yes we need to conduct it in some fashion last week your professionalism your work your reputation was impugned i believe it was yes if you're allowed if the court says okay, go ahead and finish these surveys. I want comparative county information. Are you willing to still work with us? If we do it correctly, if the idea is we want you to conduct a leading bias survey to get results that we want, then no, I'm not gonna do something that undermines my credibility, my objectivity, or do it in any way that's not consistent with the procedures and standards that have been used. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Integrity. Oh God, there he is. When is Cam? Oh God. Um, I mean, we'll start going backwards here or from the back of the, the front pocket. Um, I'm sorry if you're feeling hurt about us raising this issue. I see you were almost breaking down a few minutes ago when you were talking about slide number 33, uh, oh, slide number 31. That's not the intent and it's certainly I was I'm surprised to see that reaction from an experienced expert such as yourself. So I really? apologize for that. I, I accept your apology. But the idea of after you're working really hard 15 years to develop a credible reputation and being told on uh, watching on a Zoom that I am tainting the jury pool and poisoning the jury pool and contaminating the jury pool. 
by doing what's required and standard, I'm not crying. I'm angry. Okay. And yes, it doesn't and, matter. And please go ahead and be as angry as you like as you continue from your work for the defense in this case. Um, it is a fact, though, that you don't know of the, what, 400 citizens that were questioned on this survey. You don't know which ones of them did not already previously know any of the fact-specific representations in your questions. Isn't that true? I do know because they answered yes or no to the question. No. Oh, well, okay. Before you asked the question, you didn't know that. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so somebody who hadn't heard the representation in that one slide that you acknowledged was false. Uh, let's see. You acknowledge false that uh, Mr. Kilbert allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? That Mr. Kilbert allegedly stalked one of the victims. Yes, I was trying not to say that because. But, but, you, but you, knew, you knew that was false. I did. Yes. And so you have now, for anybody who had never heard that before, that question is now planted into them unqualified representation that Mr. Koberger stalked one of the witnesses, and that's false. That's false? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. I told you, Mr. Gonzalez, to stop saying that. On that early on in your testimony, um, you testified. I want to make sure that we heard this correctly. That inadmissible or false information is can be the most prejudicial information. It can be. Yes. And your surveyors put that false information into the minds of people who were asked that question who may not have previously heard it. Correct. Correct. Relative Thank to you. media. Thank you. It's mentioned it hundreds and thousands of times. Said no, we didn't. And we didn't just, plant it in their mind. We asked sure them about it. To, um, around the same time in your testimony, um, I believe you testified that you don't care if the information that you put in your specific questions to uh, the people being surveyed is correct. That you said that, didn't you? Right. I don't know what you mean by correct. True or false? I care about whether or not it's proliferated by the media. You don't it's care if it's true. No, I don't. I no. don't care about is it prejudicial. So it's okay to taint people who had never heard that information before for the end result of identifying others who have and might have bias. Is Your that Honor, is that gonna, a fair statement? I'm gonna object no, to the questions. Not. He's he can answer he's the question. badgering he's, he's badgering, badgering the witness. Yeah, it's an objection. He's badgering the witness. He's misstating his testimony, and I object. The witness testified you didn't care if the information was correct, Judge. Um, yeah, overruled. So, may I? So just, yeah, just. No, that's okay. One person can talk at a time. And, you know, let's take so, down. But he gets to. Thank you. Yes, Bill Thompson is going to get crushed in the courtroom when the jury sees him acting like this. This is what you guys are all. You see Bill Thompson? Ann Taylor, cool, calm, cute cupper. She is the that other cool side of the pillow. Just so we're clear, the questions, trash. fact specific questions, were propounded to people who were taking the survey. Um, did not, after asking the question, even uh, qualify the false facts as saying this may or may not be true, or this is actually a false fact. You didn't. The survey didn't tell them. That what they might have heard was false. First of all, I don't call them facts because they're media items. And then second of all, that would be ridiculous. And no, I wouldn't do that in a survey. Are you suggesting I follow up? Have you read, seen, or heard it? He stalked. And oh, by the way, if you know that, let me tell you, it's not true. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's, that's not what happens. That exactly what happens in the poor deer process. No, absolutely it does. Your Honor, I'm going to object. Argumentative. It is argumentative. Okay. Yeah, you don't get to testify exactly about that, so I'll sustain. This me. trial is going to be wild. Dr. Ellen, you participated as an attorney in Wardier in Idaho under Idaho laws. 
Have I what? Have you participated as an attorney in voir dire, conducted voir dire in a criminal case in Idaho? No, I have. And just to be clear, because um, in two places at the beginning and at the end of your testimony and your PowerPoint, this PowerPoint you, you created that as Ms. Taylor. Right. So you adopt the what the contents of the PowerPoint. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, just to be clear, not every that specific question that your surveyors asked came directly from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? Well, to be clear, they're not facts. They're media items. They're representatives of representations Your of Honor, fact. I'm, I'm going to object. And the PC affidavit. I'm objecting and ask that he allow Dr. Edelman to complete his answer before he jumps back in. They're simple yes or no questions. What was your question? Yeah. I'm. Um, uh... Let's just say one at a time, okay? Listen to him answer and we'll be through at some point. Thank you. So, Dr. Elvin, isn't it true that there are among the nine fact specific questions, that's my characterization of the nine questions, we know which ones we're talking about. Not all of the representations in those questions came from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? That is true. And are you aware that under Idaho law, probable cause affidavits in criminal cases become open to the public by operation of court rule once a person is arrested and appears in court? I'm sure that's true. I'm just not used to having press conferences to tell the media to disseminate the information far and wide. Oh, so let's talk about that. That press conference was made prior to Mr. Coburn's appearance, prior to the release of the affidavit, and the press conference only referred Object. to the media question. what would be Object. part he of didn't ask the a question. court record. Isn't that true? I don't know. You know. All I heard was, this is going to be released. I encourage you to tell your listeners and viewers and anybody who's interested in the truth. By going to the court record and looking at the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? I recall you saying, I want you to go to the court record and look at the probable cause affidavit. And what it did was see we're splitting hairs and years now, doctor. That's fine. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, go ahead. Redirect. God, Anne, just. I want to start with the probable cause affidavit. And I think you testified that that probable cause affidavit was spread far and wide in the media over and over again. Do you recall that? Let me be clear. It wasn't the probable cause affidavit that was spread far and wide. It was details taken from it, put in media stories with editorial comments back and forth in the context of news stories. It wasn't, here's a, a, a document from the government that was in the court record. Let me read it to you. That's not how it works. It's media coverage. That's how it's reported. Taken out of there, DNA spell, all the other stuff in there, reported within the context of a news story. So the news takes this document, takes things from it, and runs with it, spins with it, changes it, talks about it, and sends it out. Yes. Sometimes you think the media gets it wrong after they read something. Sorry, what? Does the media ever get it wrong after they read something? Yes. And do those stories have any less prejudice on somebody's, on, on the reader of that media, whether they're wrong or not? No. And going back to, I don't care if it's true or not, my focus is to assess whether or not media coverage is prejudicial, prejudicial, and whether or not it's developed led to opinions. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. You don't say, well, I won't test all this prejudicial stuff in the media because it's not true, so I won't include it in the survey. And I'll just assume that it had no impact on people. I find it convenient to be able to disseminate a whole bunch of prejudicial media coverage, saturate the community, and then say, oh, you have no right to test the impact of that information on, on the jury pool. So it's wonderful that you get the benefit of generating all the bias, 
by releasing it to the media and then saying, no, you're constrained defense. You're not allowed to ask questions about it because that stuff's not true. Or you have to, you might have told one person in a jury pool a detail they didn't know. Oh, they knew the other seven details that are highly prejudicial, but it was that one that shifted everything and that's gonna lead to the, the contamination. Not the thousands of newspaper stories, not the media coverage, not the stuff on social media. It was because a survey vendor called 400 people and asked a question that one person or two people in that panel or whatever it was in that 400 may not have known that one detail. They knew everything else, they're already biased, but it was because they learned that one detail, that's what shifted the scales. That to me is just ridiculous. And if somebody said, I don't know anything about this case, did you stop? Yes. Mr. Thompson was talking to you about the difference between uh, in the survey between closed questions and what can happen in board diet. Yes. I, you are not an attorney. Is that correct? Correct. Well, what's the difference between what you can do in a survey and what you can do in board diet as far as your expertise? Well, again, I sit in jury selections. I've done hundreds of them. I've done research on one year transcripts. I've done post-trial interviews for hundreds of times. So I have a pretty good idea of how the process works. Um, in a survey, I can ask those case-specific media items. Well, someone says, I just recall what was in the newspaper to the open. I can ask a follow-up. Have you read or heard if David Nichols was convicted by a jury for murder? Could never do that in a voir dire because you'd be poisoning a well, just like in the John White case we mentioned. Um, I rarely see during voir dire, somebody admits a comments on something like, oh, I read this. And then there's a whole discussion and explaining to everybody, well, that's not really true. That fact was just in social media, it's wrong. That is not a normal common thing that I've seen in voir dire. In your experience, 15 years you said doing this work, have you had a situation where you've been stopped midway through your process? No. What do you care about? What's what? What do you care about? I've, I've heard you say that whether what the media sends out there, whether all of those things are actually true or whether it's a spin off other information, that's not what's important to you. What do you care about in your work? What I'm interested in is assessing if there's prejudicial media coverage. Inadmissible prejudicial media coverage is some of the most concerning. Misinformation is some of the most concerning. What I care about is what extent of that stuff has permeated the jury pool, what do people know, and do those specific details generate bias, prejudgment? Again, I, I just, the idea that there can be all this stuff out in the public that's uh, misinformation, prejudicial, that benefits one side, and you're not allowed to ask if people know that detail because you might taint one person who already knows a whole bunch of information. But that, again, like knowing the, the, the detail about the stalking comment. Okay, that person knows all this stuff, but that's the thing that's going to change everything. And now that person's poisoned because they heard it in a survey. But the fact that there's thousands of newspaper articles and television stories and comments on social media, 80% um, of people in this community have talked about this case according to the survey. None of that matters. It's because I did a survey and asked that question. I mean, that's just, I just, I don't even know what to say. You still want to finish the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? I'm sorry? Will you still do the surveys if we're allowed to do them right? Yes, if we're doing them correctly, I'm open to continuing. Now, I think this whole thing has created quite a whole new narrative that it's almost wrong that the defense is doing something inappropriate by doing the same standard survey that's been done hundreds of times in other cases, including in Idaho. Um, so I, I don't know how people will respond because of all of this and what is generated, but I would certainly try if we're doing the survey correctly. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. So one thing I just want to sort of clear up because it's come up here back and forth back and forth uh, with the uh, the questions that aren't true okay? and those uh, those were not in the uh, the 
probable cause affidavit. And so I think it does have some bearing on the non dissemination order because our whole purpose, okay, both, both, both uh, counsel uh, were trying to protect these things from coming out to the public or to the media. That's, I think, one of the, the key issue, okay, or the concern about these particular statements. So there were two questions right at the end. Um, and <clears throat> the ethics, okay, of the lawyers, basically, this uh, non dissemination order is really a mirror of the ethics in Idaho especially for uh, the lawyers who are participating in the case. And one of the things that uh, is permissive for help in putting this information out to the public is information contained in the public record. Okay, so the public record is a case file that is available to the public. That's that's the law. And so to to then say, well, we have these other issues, okay, of concern uh, that have been spread through the media, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, as you've said, uh, that we need to we need to test that. But then it it, it is a tight rope to balance this. So I'm just not accusing anybody i'm just saying this this is one of the things that's pushed or pulled uh both sides apart and puts me in a, a very difficult situation okay trying to make that fair for everybody okay so that's what that's about i'm not asking you to answer anything no, but i'm just trying to think about the solution um uh i don't know if there is a solution okay it's out there but it it does have some bearing on additional surveys. And what you're saying is uh, if you can't use this, do uh, or uh, apply the surveys if you want to uh, complete, um, that you need the same questions. Otherwise, it's not legitimate. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Okay, so if you if you have an answer to that, that's let me ask you this. One. So if you said you can ask certain case like media items, like the other seven, for example, that may come from the record, um, that's a possibility because you you can still measure what we're talking about. These specific knowledge when you ask these questions is high. These the more you know, the more likely they are to be prejudiced and biased. And you see differences in the ADA count or a different count. Now, you have to acknowledge there is this other stuff out there that's highly prejudicial, um, and we will not know if the rate of, of the awareness of those details are, are as significant as they are here. So then it's it's an unknown. So if, if the argument is, well, it doesn't look so bad because all they know are the things that in the affidavit, for example. Well, well you're, you're, it, there's this unknown out there, again, because those items happen to be one of some of the more prejudicial items um, that we found. Yeah, and this is a death penalty case. And so uh, when we're talking to jurors, we're going to probably talk to a lot of jurors individually. Sure. And it's going to be on the record. And we're going to talk about them, about what they think or what they've heard uh, in, in, in real detail. So there's that. Okay. So I am. I guess I'm kind of wondering too, in terms of um, all the people that may have been called that didn't pick up the phone or don't want to pick up the phone because everybody knows, okay, that oh, I don't know this person as my phone is ringing. Yeah, and I'm not, and and then there are lots of people, including me, that would never, never answer a question, okay, on the phone. So how do you how do you deal with that? How do you balance that? There could be, you know, 400 people out there in Latah County that say, I I don't want to say anything about this. Yeah. How do you how do you factor that 
Well, two, so yeah, two things. So I was unpacking both of So the jury selection question, like I'm sure you've done a million of these. I've done quite a bit. I've done a lot of high price violence. And from my experience, asking people in a general case, like a DUI, um, what do you think about DUI? And they tell you generally I'm against it. That doesn't, or you know, I have a big issue with that, whatever. That doesn't mean they can't be jerked because it's a general attitude. It's nothing case specific. And there's a, hundreds of studies that show general attitudes are much less predictive than case than specific attitudes. This is different and unique because we're talking about attitudes and beliefs specific towards this case. That's a whole different animal. And that's the unique nature of high profile cases. So when you talk to people individually, you still have the memory issue. You still have the recall issue. Like you will, they will not, you will not elicit everything that you're It's just memory does not work. It doesn't matter if they're under oath, private. There's so much research on it. It doesn't, our brains don't change just because we're under oath. We work the way they work. Um, your other question goes to um, response bias. Like what's the response rate? Um, is there something unique about people you miss and so on? So there's a lot of work on that. And one of the things we do is why we, we collect like demographic information is to see, are we missing groups? Are we overrepresenting one group or the other? If we are, is there a relationship between that factor and bias? Um, and there's a lot of research on response rates and what it finds is surveys that have high response rates where like everybody takes their survey and surveys that have low response rates uh, where it's like, less than 10% and you compare them with kind of public opinion polling and so on, public politics, there's no difference. You find very, in, in most instances, the results are the same in the surveys. So high response rates are not necessarily correlated with more reliable, valid um, survey findings. And, and that's something they've done a lot of work on because survey rates or response rates have gone down slightly. Like I think oh, some of that. Yeah, they have. For sure. Well, I mean, yeah, so it could be that you're just getting People who like to talk on the phone yeah. with strangers. Yeah, and I from from this case, I think people are so invested in it, like a lot of unique things. So people, you know, talking about what's happening, they're very invested in this case. It's unique in small community. It's not surprising. Um, but just be, what 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 I'm finding, and there's so much prejudgment, detail, and so on. I don't think it. I, I think it's fairly representative of what you're going to see. Almost everybody in this jury pool knew about the case, like comparable to like the George Floyd case. Um, the bias was the same in terms of comparing it not to um, Chauvin, who was the one George Floyd, but Alexander King, who was another officer on the scene. Like the race are similar to that. So that was another high profile case that was a lot of tension and stress, and so on. And we still got very meaningful data. And, and yeah, we've done so many times. like. You kind of understand like response rates are going to be lower, um, but there's nothing to indicate that, for example, we're missing an important group. And if we were, we would weigh the data to account for that. So there's just so so in Lake County, it was uh, about one percent of their population. Yeah. It, so hypothetically, if we say, oh, well, I mean, one of the one of these uh, counties that we're interested in, in Lake County, just and bodies, yeah, uh, for other reasons too. Um, but uh, would it be one percent of the population in Boise? No. no. So okay, so so that's I I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah, you have to talk about you know two thousand people. Yeah. Okay. Can I explain how that? Yeah. Works? Go ahead. Yeah. So it's a great question. So um, you can take a small sample and generalize to the population. Is that correct? So like if you look at uh, surveys of the United States, the, the sample sizes are similar to what we did here. Maybe it's a thousand. And now you're generalizing to every city, county, and so on across the country. Um, everybody has a known probability of being selected. Um, how, how you pick your sample size, there's this called power analysis. So remember, you know how you see polls that just like, you see a number like 90% and they say plus or minus 5%. Um, so it's either 85 to 95%. Basically it's plus or minus 5 that's kind of the industry standard and you take a conservative approach. So let's say um, you ask a yes or no question, you would say 50% would say yes, 50% would say no. So that's a lot of variance. So that's the worst case scenario. How many people do you need to talk to? So if that happens, um, your confidence interval is plus or minus 5%. Um, and that comes up to 400. So 
If you did eight accounting, it would be 400, and your confidence interval would be the same as it is here with a small fraction. Anyway, so as long as it uh, is using the general concept of a randomized sample, you can generalize that population with that synthesis. So if I have interpreted this uh, with one of your answers just a week from the moment ago about the um, getting rid of the questions that are false, okay, that just came from the media that it did not come from the uh, public. Uh, well, from the public, but not the legal part. Um, would you go away, go ahead with that and have legitimate data? So I think, I think you have the nine questions. So if you look at it, are the other ones okay? Are you telling me there's two that you would like to exclude and keep the other seven? Well, maybe. I'm, I'm not, I haven't made a decision, okay. but I'm just wondering if, I mean, at first in your testimony, you said, well, if we, if we can't, I can't do it without doing the same questions. That's a, that's one of the one of the problems, okay? The, the part of this argument. I mean, if if maybe it can be done without uh, sort of sending information out there that is false, that might in, you know affect people that are looking into that or thinking that it, it is they believe in it, even though they shouldn't. Um, is that something that can be done? Well, there's if you do it that way, you're, you're, there are potential compounds or things that will arise. Um, and again, I, I, the thing I struggle with, and I get, I understand the public record dissemination. So we've done this before. Um, the thing I get to is like we're not really disseminating it. We're asking if people know about detail that has been disseminated through the megaphone of the media. So I'm really trying to just track what people know. I'm, I'm not trying to pass on information through a megaphone. So I'm talking about. 400 people that are talking to that other county of five, you know, 500,000 or something, the data county, the, 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 the plus the, the risks and benefits of, of doing it that way. It seems like there's a very low risk of, of undermining or contaminating the jury pool when you're doing that versus the risk of getting a, a huge black hole of, well, we don't know what percentage know this highly prejudicial detail. Um, like what are the odds or like what impact is doing a survey going to have on the jury of the community relative to the media coverage that's already out there? So do you ever do you ever put a caveat on the beginning of the questions where you say, well, uh, we want you to understand uh, as we go through these questions that uh, we're not determining guilt or innocence. We're not uh, we're not determining false or true, uh, we just are interested in, in our, uh, your answer to our questions, and we uh, want to be careful that we're not sending out something that you are not going to understand. So, yeah, so we do always, there's an introduction and there's kind of, there's no right or wrong answers to any of your questions. You can always say no opinion or I don't know to any question. Uh, it's going to remain anonymous. We're just interested in your views and so on. So there's an introduction to that that section with the those nine items. Usually it says you may have uh, we're going to go through some items in the media. Um, you may have already reported some of these already, but we're interested in what you've seen or heard. Um, we can add a caveat to that. Like some of these may not be true. And if that addresses it. Some of these things were not all of these media items are actually accurate. Sure. People pick up the phone for somebody and they think, you know, some somebody with authority maybe, and they they think, oh, well, this is, you know, this is really kind of the beginning of the tribe or something. I mean, pe people misunderstand all kinds of things out there, right? So we can certainly tweak the intro. Now we don't just jump into it. We don't say we're an authority. You know, it's usually. You know, no, I know you, you don't say that. I just saying, it, you know. Yeah. It, it, so we, we we can work on the introduction if that would address some of those concerns so that people understand uh, not everything in the media is active. But the thing is, like, I would if, if we're going to say, for example, not everything in the media is true, uh, they get a lot of things wrong. You wouldn't you you would not want to say that before you do the prejudgment question. You can do that after 
when you do the case specific items because I, I, what I want to know is what are people's opinions about guilt or innocence? I don't want to give them instructions and then get socially desirable response in the survey. Yes. So you, you you don't sort of measure it, uh, this person as their bias until you get into the specific questions, the well, specific we, stuff, because otherwise it's just yes or no, and you can't determine bias just from that. Well, no, yeah. So we the prejudgment question comes before the case specific media item questions because then you would criticize. If I read those nine items and then I said, okay, do you think he's guilty? I just told you all the stuff you may not know. Yeah. So the question is, do you know about the case? And then it's based off of what you've read, seen, or heard about this case. Or do you think so and so is guilty of murder or whatever the crime is charged? And it's on scale. Um, yes, definitely guilty. Yes, probably guilty. I don't know. Probably not guilty to know that. Based off of what they've already been exposed to without you giving them anything. So they have no information beyond what they've seen in their home. Um, and then you ask open ended questions like, what do you know about the case? Um, and then other things. And then you get to those case specific media items. And that's when you can do it theoretically measure bias. Yeah. Well, I mean, I correlate those recognition items with the prejudgment questions of earlier, right? So correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Yeah. So, well, they're, they're chi squares. You can do different things. You can do linear regression, whatever you want. But what I want to know is just people who report later on, they know that detail. Did they report uh, stronger views of guilt? So if like, I'll give you an example, like uh, if you only do two of those items, prejudgment was only 20%. So if you only do two out of the nine items, most people had no opinion. Versus if you knew seven or more of those items, it jumps up to 82%. So that's telling you like the more facts you know, the more case knowledge you have, the stronger your opinion is. Right? And, and that's what you'd see in the literature. That's what you'd expect to see. Um, so if if somebody was being told, oh, that was just all false information, would that bring down the bias? In what? Measure? But you, you, you were saying earlier that it kind of pessimistic, I think, maybe, but maybe absolutely correct that once people uh, have a, an opinion, they're not going to let go of it. He's trying to keep the, the case. Truth. Yes, yes. Dude. So persistence. There's a bunch of research on that. That's kind of going around. It's yeah. Political. And we see it it's right now. Yeah, like if you talk about everybody has an opinion of uh, Donald Trump. So if I'm you're going to say, it. yeah, I know. But if neither you, are you. Yeah. So. All right. So um, thank you you're for right. that. Um, any questions online, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, I don't have any other questions for Dr. Edelman, and we do have a summary for the court at the appropriate time. Okay. Mr. Thompson, anything online? Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, so go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Matzoff is going oh, to give her a Okay, just one second. I, I'm ignoring the court reporter, and I'm just so immense in this that I, I need to worry about maybe rest. Are you, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, well, um, thank you, Dr. Edelman. I uh, appreciate your testimony there. So, um, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let's go ahead. Thank, thank you, you, Judge. I realize it's it's late in the day, and I will tell you that I um, this takes about nine minutes for me to sum this up. But I do want to talk about something in advance because you're asking questions of our expert about this process and changing the process that is impacted in the United States Supreme Court law. And the United States Supreme Court law requires that part of the analysis for the court on presumed prejudice include false media coverage. It's not enough for it to be all truthful media coverage. So before you um, start suggesting that an expert change his methodology that's accepted practice, it's really important that you go back and look at Skilling and Haddon and the lineage of cases that get us to venue and what the court has to decide um, in determining presumption. The question you asked be answered today is where do we go from here in the survey process? I want to answer that question in two parts by summarizing what we can do and what we can't do. 
we can and we need to finish the process that the defense undertook. It was completely valid. It was standard in cases like this. Dr. Edelman is an expert in this field, and he has done this jury research and this work for 15 years. Nothing about the format, the methodology, the questions, or the fact of the survey itself was wrong. You've talked about two questions that you are describing as false because they're not in the affidavit. But if you look at that affidavit and what the media has done with those things is they have created a narrative based on the facts that are represented in the affidavit. Now, I would agree that there are a lot of, there's a lot of information in that affidavit that is just flat and not true. But if we focus on where we are right now, there are representations in the affidavit about multiple trips to Moscow from Pullman and a return trip to Moscow from Pullman in the morning that lead a reader to the word of stocking that you have a problem with that word being included. Reflect back on the case law in the United States State Supreme Court about showing false information, but also look at that affidavit and the way the media has construed that in its representations, in its reporting that is so prejudicial. Because the basis for this spin, the foundation is right there in what you are describing as the public record. Now, I fundamentally disagree that that the only public record in this case is what's there um, on the 12 page uh, docket. Um, the, the public record in this case that the entire nation and the world and looking at, and especially Latah County, is derived and construed out of that, that public record. So can I ask you a question about that? This public record thing is really kind of circling around because what's what's the purpose then of the uh, non-dissemination order? If if everything out there in the public is is Give me the discovery. Public record. Come on, well, baby. My understanding, Your Honor, is that it's the, the one of the primary issues was the credibility of the person that is out there speaking. We did not want law enforcement, 159 officers out there talking about police reports and disseminating that. We didn't want the prosecutor doing press conferences like we saw on 12-30-2022. We didn't want the defense getting up and doing press conferences based on the information because we have information that no one else um, has. And we are consulting with experts that the public doesn't know about. And so we have a level of credibility that the others uh, don't have. And so that is my understanding of what we're trying to get a hold of. And, and it's and it's been pretty effective in this case until this um, valid survey that happens in high profile cases has been Capital construed case. to be Capital something um, nefarious, which it absolutely is not. As you've heard, it's been used in Boston bombing, the Parkland shooting, the Colorado theater, George Floyd, hundreds of cases going back decades. Dr. Edelman's declaration and now his testimony are uncontroverted evidence before this court on this issue. It's the actual evidence that the court, and, and finally today, you're getting informed about the validity and the science behind the process. Nothing that was done is worth the hysteria and the hyperbole that keeps getting expressed in this courtroom. The questions asked, the topics, the order, the open-ended, the specifics, they were all done using information that is out there for everyone to see. And the research methods used to determine what was out there is the traditional way and the scientific method that experts in this field use just as Dr. Edelman testified. And to be sure, the purpose of this is to give you information so that you can make an informed decision about venue. 
It's not for a nefarious purpose. It's to arm you with facts and information so that you can apply the United States Supreme cases that have been adopted in Idaho and determine, determine whether or not there's presumed prejudice. You know, when we first started talking about whether or not there was going to be this venue hearing um, sooner rather than later, uh, Ms. Beatty for the state said at least three times, Judge, they can't just come in here with affidavits. This case law says that they have to have more. The more that we are gathering to provide you, at least part of it, is this survey. In terms of the process, proposition that this survey taints the jury pool. First of all, you heard from Dr. Edelman that if someone answers they don't know, a second question tapping into that is asked and the process stops. There's no other questions other than demographics because they don't want to poison um, anybody who doesn't know. So. For there to be this proposition that all of these questions, these nine questions that are later on in the process were put out there intentionally to poison the jury pool, it's that's just flat false. And the other point is you can't taint what's tainted. When you hear what the statistics are, as it relates to this county, 97% of the people had familiarity with the case. 79% of the people knew five or more prejudicial and false media reports. 81% of those who had heard about the stalking had determined and, and had, a, had took a position that Mr. Koberger is guilty. These people that were surveyed didn't form the opinion when they were being surveyed. And they didn't then go research their already strongly held opinion because of the survey. These are deeply held opinions in this community within this jury pool. The Laycock County citizens have accepted the information placed before them by state actors. It's not just Mr. Thompson that did a media report and talked about the uh, probable cause affidavit. Chief Fry, the coroner Kathy Mabbitt, uh, we've got search warrants from Pennsylvania out there in the public record. We've got hundreds of search warrants in the public record out there um, from Idaho. We've got all kinds of pleadings. This is all information that's put out in, into the media. And, and having the state now claim this moral high ground is an oxymoron. It's a complete oxymoron for state actors to put this information out in the public and now say, hey, wait, if you want to ask if people have believed the information that we've put out there, you can't do that. That harms Mr. Koberger. We as a defense team have the obligation and frankly the privilege of defending Mr. Koberger and defending his right to a fair trial. And in doing so, in arguing that venue should be changed, we have to show you that there is presumed prejudice in this community. And since we have the burden of this, and you now know essentially from this expert that there is presumed prejudice in Laytock County, you have to ask yourself, do you want more information to know where the better venue is. And that takes me to the next point, which is what we cannot do. You've heard Dr. Edelman say that it goes outside of his standard of practice um, and the, the, his, the um, scientific method that has been used for decades, that has been used in hundreds of cases to take your ideas about what should be in uh, questions, to take the state's ideas about what's being in questions, should be in, in questions in the survey. He follows a process. That's the process that he needs to follow because he has to provide the court with apples to apples comparison. Another issue that has um, 
was addressed last week that I want to touch upon, and there are two, is this concept that if we just done a juror questionnaire, it would have addressed all of that. At the stage that we're at now, which is setting ourselves up for and preparing for a venue hearing, we have to justify a venue change. The standard that you're going to be looking at, according to the Supreme Court, is whether or not a presumption exists where the record demonstrates that the community is saturated with prejudicial faults and inflammatory media publicity about the crime. The case law mentions faults, media publicity about the crime. That's what the survey assesses now. Another way to determine actual prejudice is a questionnaire, and that is done prior to selecting the jury. And at that time, we are looking for actual individual bias of the prospective juror. There are different methods used at different stages of the case. And right now, the proper method is a survey. Another solution that you mentioned last Thursday was simply to strike 400 people surveyed from the veneer. And I want to talk about that. First of all, that doesn't address the problem that's very clear that we have in Laytop County. And so if you extrapolate uh, the, the percentage of people that have uh, drawn a conclusion about Mr. Koberger's guilt, if you extrapolate that to the county with numbers like 81% have concluded if they um, are familiar with the media information about stalking, there's no prospective jurors in this in this county. You mentioned, you know, this is one um, percent, but there's much more analysis to what the prospective jury pool is here. Pool is here. First of all, the jury commissioner. I think you talked about her when we were talking about whether or not jury trial was going to be a speedy trial was going to be waived. You said I think it had expanded the pool to a thousand. Am I right about that number? That I can't remember. It was. Probably maybe more. Okay. So if you extrapolate the numbers that we know of prejudice exists, I mean, that leaves us with a very small uh, jury pool for trying to uh, do uh, voir dire in a death penalty case. But if you look at the population as a whole, what the U.S. Census says about Lata County is that almost 18% of the population here is under the age of 18. Almost 18% of the population here is over the age of 65. That eliminates, you know, close to 35% of the population that's even eligible to be in your jury pool. Second, and more importantly, I can't find statutory and legal authority for you to strike 400 people out of the near up front. I found the opposite. As you know, the clerk of the jury commissioner pulls from the jury poll that's approved by Idaho Code. And this is a really important section in Idaho Code 2-202. It is the policy of this state that all persons selected for jury service be selected at random from a fair cross section of the population and that all qualified citizens have the opportunity to be considered for jury service. Rest assured, I was just being sarcastic. Okay, well, I, I took your sarcasm to heart, I guess, yeah, last I week. I apologize. Uh, because it was a very serious day, right? Every day is very serious. Right, but uh, last Thursday was in particularly um, a tough one. I think we can all agree. There's going to be more, more tough ones to add, I'm sure. For sure, for sure. And we all need to give each other grace. Thank you. I will end by saying this. Our defense team firmly, and I mean firmly, believes in Mr. Koberger's innocence. And right now he's being held to have a trial in a county that believes that he is guilty. In this country, we pride ourselves on a jury system that doesn't stand for that. In this moment, I see that you have two choices. You can let us continue and do comparative surveys as planned, or you can maintain the stay and at the venue motion, you will hear that the data for Laytaw County shows a presumption of prejudice, but you will not have comparative surveys to fully inform the court. As you consider this, there is absolutely nothing that gets risked if you change venue. 
But if you deny a change of venue, Mr. Koberger's constitutional right to a fair trial is denied. There's only one human being in this case with the right to a fair trial. It's Mr. Koberger's and his alone. There's no legal right of this community to have a jury trial here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Let me bring this back into perspective. Our motion deals with the court's non dissemination order. It was agreed to by the defense. In fact, the idea of the non dissemination order was initiated by the defense, their February 30th, 2022 motion for a non dissemination order uh, to prevent extrajudicial statements. That would be statements outside of the public record, which is the court record. Uh, that have a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemn condemnation of the accused. And the state's position is that the fact specific questions, and I, I understand Dr. Edelman why the questions were asked. I understand his explanation. It doesn't change the fact that we have a non dissemination order that specifically prohibits that kind of dissemination of facts, specific facts about this case. Facts that include those that are not true, acknowledged from the stand they are not true. Which, interestingly enough, I look at the PowerPoint and slide 15, which talks about the American Society of Trial Consultants Professional Code on Venue Survey, says false facts should generally not be used to test accuracy of other responses in venue surveys. So, if false facts are used, they must be clearly false. There's no possibility that respondents who know about the case used false facts with true facts that have been publicized. We have an inconsistency there, which frankly is logical. It makes sense. And the state is coming from a point a position of being practical and trying to use common sense here. As I listen to what we have heard today and in part from last week, it seems that the position of the defense is it is okay to risk tainting additional jurors in order to ascertain bias of other potential jurors. And I'm not sure that that's the way this court should do business. If we accept what the defense is suggesting at this point, and again, we are not arguing venue today, and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to get into all these numbers and all those sorts of things. We'll save those for, for another day. But if we were to accept that we have perhaps on one issue, 20% of the jury pool statistically available, well, that's more than enough people to select a jury from. So it's not nearly as overwhelming, overwhelmingly compelling as I think it's being suggested here. Um, I want to be clear again, uh, Ms. Massoff, used the word nefarious several times, suggesting the defense was, or that the state was accusing the defense of being nefarious. And if we are not, Your Honor, I, I am not suggesting that there was any will, ill will or motive by anybody over here. What we are suggesting and what we believe that the record shows is that this court issued a specific order prohibiting the dissemination of specific types of information, including the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented, including the performance results of the examination or test. There's no question that those nine questions included violations of the court's no contact order. That's what we're here about. And apparently there was some miscommunication or misunderstanding between about the integrity or the importance of the non-dissemination order. Um, it sounds like today that maybe because these types of surveys are common nationwide, then the non-dissemination order really doesn't matter, which is a little disconcerting, but I don't care about what happens anywhere else. All I care about is what happens in Lake Talk County, in this court. It's far above my pay grade to go and analyze 
what happens in a big city or some other part of the country. I know Lake Talk County. That's where my interests are. That's where our interests are here. On the issue of whether the survey can be changed, I think that that does present some challenges based on what we've heard here today. Uh, but the solution for that is very easy. We just back up and if the defense wants to pursue the survey, they do a new survey with a new group of people and take out the objectionable questions. And then once they've done that, they proceed to do that identical survey in other veneers around the state, whichever ones they want to select. And that would be the proper way to do this. Now we may hear, oh my goodness, that's going to consume time or that's going to consume a lot of money. Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't care. If it can't be done right, or if that's what it takes to do it right, then we need to do it. This is a big case. And the finger for this cannot be pointed to anybody but the defense. I'm not suggesting an evil intent, but the practical effect of the decisions made on behalf of the defense was to ask these questions and to create a situation that we've been having to deal with now for two hearings over the past week, well into the evening on Wednesday. That's the way forward, Judge. Thanks. Judge, I'm just gonna end really quickly with this. We didn't violate the non-dissemination order. You know, the, the information that now he's calling facts, you know, it's flip-flopping between whether or not it's uh, a false fact or a fact that's, that's in the survey. The information that was put in the survey is based on the public record and information that the way that the state and state actors put information into the public record that has now been disseminated. And we have not violated that order. And I do resent being accused of that. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, those, those two questions were not in the public record. Okay. They were. I mean, they came out, but that, that was not the, not the, uh, Court, the the, the um, I mean, where it came from, it just came out of the media or somewhere. Who knows where it came from? But I don't think there's anything, not that I'm aware of, in the in the public record that said anything about that about your client. So, I mean, here we are. I mean. That happened. It's kind of unfortunate. Uh, I I totally understand uh, the the reason to have false information out there, but I mean I I have to just want to clear that up. The other the other questions that's all from the public record. I have a question. But anybody tell you can find. Some, somewhere in the in the public uh, public record that those uh, claims were made, I'd like to see that. But I think both sides are looking at a different definition of what public record is. I have looked it up. It's the public record. From the case. So that aside, I, I appreciate um, the testimony, uh, the arguments from both sides. I think it's a challenging issue. Uh, it's something that I'm going to have to struggle through and figure out uh, what to do. Um, and I understand that there's some urgency. We get that out, so I'll, I'll do my best. Probably not to be this week. So, anything else we need to talk about?
Mrs. Taylor. Your Honor, just um, the logistics of the court's decision is yet to come. We can't continue the surveys. And we've got deadlines next week, midweek, for briefing and the motion for change of venue for May. So I'm wondering if we want to consider resetting that motion and that deadline now. I still want to keep the hearing on May 14th. We have a motion to compel already filed to be heard that day. So we could still use reserved court time to make some further advances in the case. But I'm concerned about being properly prepared for the change of venue waiting for the decision, especially if we're allowed to continue to work. Sure. And I, I told you last week that I would give you more time. I won't be terrible. Um, okay. So you want to change that hearing. You want to lead the May We're set on May 14 at 1.30. We have. You want to keep that for the motion to compel? Yes, please. But you want to move out uh, the hearing on change of venue? I believe that's the only prudent thing to do at this time. Um, yes, Judge, I think that we should. Um, Based on some availability of team members and experts, though, I think we're not ready or we won't have the team available until the fourth week of June for all of the people that are necessary. You want to just wait and just talk to each other, uh, talk, you know, just, you know, have a hearing again. Judge, I, I don't. I don't I, think I, we're going to have an agreement on the change of venue issue. Um, if I if I thought we could come to an agreement on that, I'd say yes. Let's not set one. Let's talk. Oh but no, I mean, no, I'm not suggesting that you would agree on agreement on a, on change of venue. I just mean changing the year, the date. I'm, Your Honor, we would suggest the last week of June, and if the prosecutor's ready to weigh in on that, and the court's ready, we'd prefer to get a date now. Okay. Mr. Thompson, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it would be appropriate to reset the dates uh, and really what what's going to drive this in part, well, in large part, will be your honor's decision on what we've been talking about today. Uh, but I think it may be prudent for the court to, it would be prudent for the court to vacate the hearing on a motion for change of venue and prepare to reset um, a briefing schedule and a hearing date on the motion for change of venue to a reasonable future time. Okay. To allow the parties to react to whatever the court's decision may be, and I don't want the court to feel pressured on the time of its decision. I'd rather take the time to do it right uh, than to rush things and just bollocks it all up. Well, I won't rush it, uh, and I will feel the pressure. Uh, Appreciate that, Don. Uh, how about we set this for one third? We'll vacate the uh, hearing on change the venue and reset it for January 27. That's a Thursday, which is, seems to be a good day or just generally except today. What did I say? June. Sorry. Your Honor. It's a long day. June, June 27. I thought you said the end of June, right? June 27 is perfect. I, I am thinking, though, that if we should maybe schedule for a full day, we estimated an hour for this and we are well beyond that now, and we anticipate testimony. There's 10 o'clock, will that work? It will, thank you. Okay. And we're for you, Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir, we should, we should be, we are available that day, at least. Those of who we even were right here. Okay. Oh, and that includes Ms. Jennings. Uh, and then hopefully Ms. Beatty and Mr. Well, I'm going to ask them next, and then I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Massa. I'm good. Okay, great. Okay. 
Mr. Nye and Ms. Beatty? Yes, Your Honor, that date and time works for us as well. Okay, perfect. Okay, 10 o'clock, June 27. Um, okay, is there anything? Oh, yeah, briefs. What do you think, Ms. Taylor? I mean, I, I know you can't know until I give you a decision, so. Your Honor, the, the briefing schedule that the court gave us was uh, roughly about a month prior to the hearing. Um, we could try that, but if the court's decision takes a while and if we want to do, if we're allowed to finish our surveys, then we might have to have some time to do a supplemental. Sure. I'll be flexible about that. I, let's say, hypothetically, that we have more surveys, uh, then we might even have to push it out. That's I, possible. Yeah. Especially, no. Uh, yeah. Mr. Edelman, uh, Dr. Edelman told me that you know, you don't necessarily, if you go to a larger population, that you have to have a percentage of it. It's just, and with the, I the magic of statistics. Your Honor, if we're allowed to finish what we started, we think from the time we could get it going, it would be three weeks. And then Dr. Edelman would need a bit of time to assimilate the data into a report. You think uh, it all went well, that uh, you could have your briefs or whatever other information by May 31st? Yes, yes. Uh, Your Honor, with a caveat, unless there's a, Ca a long caveat, delay. Caveat, caveat, okay. If there's not a long delay in me knowing what we can do, yes. Thanks. What do you think for the state, maybe a deadline of June 14th? Um, so, actually, yeah. I, actually, I think uh, that Ms. Beatty is going to be handling the venue issues. So how about we ask her? Okay, Ms. Beatty? And Your Honor, Mr. Nye and I will both be handling that, but that works for us. Okay, fantastic. And then um, maybe a reply by June 20? You think? We can do that. Okay, that'll give me time to look at all that before the hearing on June 27th. All right, thank you for your patience. Um, anything else then? We have to talk about this one motion. You said we'll put it at the end of the case and at the end of the day. Oh, the prosecutor's filing. Yes, I'll yes. take a look at that with him before okay. I leave the courtroom, Your Honor. All right. Is we, there, go ahead. If the issues that I have, if they're redacted, then we'd have a stipulation. I'll just show them what let's, I was talking let's about. Let's see if we can do that. That you two can yes, sir. that. Okay. Anything else with that, Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Thompson. No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for everybody's endurance and have a good evening. Thank you. Sorry for the